Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the third uh, meeting of the work group on waste reduction and recycling. We're delighted to have you here. I'm going to turn it over to the chairman of the Environment and Transportation Committee, Kumar Barve, to make some opening remarks. Thank, well, thank you, you for very much, Brooke. And uh, thank you to everybody who's uh, signed up to testify here and all the members of the committee. And thank you to all of the members of the public who are watching. This is the third of three um, uh, briefings on this topic of waste and recycling. It's certainly not the end of the conversation. And it's not the, the it's, uh, we're, we're not going to pretend to say that we know everything, but we're, we're, we've gotten up to speed very, very quickly. I want to especially thank Brooke for the stellar job she's there. running this process. And so I'm just going to conclude by saying that we don't intend, I don't intend for this to be the end of the process, but it's certainly the end of our formal briefing process right now. And again, I, I'd like to thank everyone who's pr participated up until now, and especially to thank everybody who's participating today. So with that, Brooke, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling us together. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining us for this third meeting. And as the chairman said, this is not the end of the conversation, but we have heard from dozens of people after we will have heard from dozens of people from all different points of view after this meeting. It's been incredibly informative. Um, I also want to thank the members of the work group, delegates Boyce, Clark, Weivel, Terasa, Harrison, and Love, and also welcome Vice Chair Dana Stein as well. Um, thank you to Trish and to Kristen for getting us online and keeping us organized. Um, so the work group is focused on making Maryland a greener, cleaner state and more environmentally friendly so that we can have um, you know, just a cleaner environment and that we can make sure it's economical. Um, we decided to pull together this series of briefings to hear from experts on different topics associated with the challenges and opportunities that Maryland is facing regarding waste. And the goal of these briefings is to create a space for all different stakeholders from local government, waste, recycling industries, advocates, consumers to share their perspective with legislators before the legislative session. Um, so there's two topics for today's briefing, the intersection of plastics and recycling and composting or organics recycling. On the first panel, we're going to hear from Marylanders representing the American Chemistry Council and Ameripen, Recycle Bag Association, UMSEs, and others. Um, I did want to note one thing that I think is worth everybody thinking about and those who are watching is that recyclers have been particularly hard hit during coronavirus. The recycling industry, of course, needs to turn a profit to be able to reprocess some of the plastic that people toss into their bins. And that means selling its reclaimed plastic as a commodity to companies that want to make something new. But plastic is made from oil and oil prices have been plunging. And so recyclers can't compete in a market in which new or virgin plastic is cheaper to buy than recycled plastic. So the economics of recycling are constantly changing. And it's something that we're learning more about and have to keep in mind. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our first panel. We're gonna hold all questions until the end of the panel. Um, so if the panelists, after you speak, please go on mute, but stick around because there may be questions from legislators at the end of the panel. Also, I'd like to remind everybody to limit yourselves to no more than, uh, I'm gonna cut you off, just a hard cut off at five minutes, but I'd like you to wrap it up uh, between four and five minutes and I will keep a timer and I will do my best to remind you, but most of you have iPhones, so feel free to set that timer <laughs> for yourself as well. So when you see the four minute, you know that you need to, to start wrapping it up. So Trish is already getting us ready to go on the screen and we're gonna turn it over to start with Craig uh, Cookson from the American Chemistry Council. Craig, take it away. Great, can you all hear me? Yes. Great, well, thank you uh, to, to Chairman Barve and members of the, of the work group today. Uh, pleased to be here, I'm Craig Cookson. I'm the Senior Director of Recycling and Recovery at the American Chemistry Council. American Chemistry Council represents the leading companies in chemistry and I'm in our plastics division uh, which uh, represents the leading manufacturers of plastics resins. So quickly, I was asked to speak about advanced recycling today and wanted to just start off with, you know, the importance of why we use plastics, right? Plastics help us save money, reduce environmental uh, impacts, 
Um, really, when you think about food and keeping food fresh, as we all know, food uh, waste is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. So plastics play a huge role in protecting all the, the inputs that went into producing that food um, so it doesn't become wasted. Um, oops, sorry. A good example of that is, you know, in the, in the complex engineering that goes into these, this is from sealed air, is sometimes in some of these packaging, you might see five, six, seven different layers of uh, plastics that help sort of keep these, the, the food fresh and again, protect, you know, those resources that have been put into uh, producing food. And I'll talk a little bit about that's where advanced recycling comes in um, later on. Also, just a, one of our favorite examples, coffee packaging. You look at a plastic brick versus the old steel coffee can, reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 75% across the life cycle. ACC and our, and our members rolled out our circular economy goals a couple years ago. Uh, we just released our roadmap for that, but really the key thing is by 2041, we want 100% of plastics packaging to be reused, recycled, or recovered. So what is advanced recycling? Really briefly, um, mechanical recycling, as folks know, usually use a homogenous mix of plastics. Uh, think your plastic water bottles, soda bottles, or on the other hand, milk jugs. Take those, they wash them, they shred them, they melt them, and they extrude them into new pellets, right? Um, and those pellets are great to go back into a lot of different products, benches and, and fleece jackets and, and railroad ties and other uh, buckets, crates, and sometimes packaging again as well. What advanced recycling is, is really taking plastics and breaking them back down further to their basic chemical components and then rebuilding them back into different products, a whole versatile mix of products. So building blocks for new chemicals, feedstocks for new plastics, plastic additives, waxes, lubricants. It's a very versatile. If you like chemistry, it's a very interesting area. Um, what are the types of advanced recycling? Um, this is from Closed Loop Partners. They released a report last year that really sort of broke these into, it, there's no monolithic technology, right? Purification dissolves plastics and then kind of rebuilds them by um, into sort of virgin equivalent polymers. Decompensation sort of breaks apart the polymer links and then puts them back together to make new products. And then conversion is really bringing, bringing them back to um, their original state of a, a feedstock. And let me just start by saying, you know, one of the key technologies there is, is called pyrolysis. And how that works is you take plastics and it can be a heterogeneous mix of plastics and including those, um, the, 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 the seven layer um, example I showed. You take those, you melt them until they, you know, you, you heat them until they melt, you keep heating them until they turn to gas vapors, and then you cool and condense those gas vapors back into feedstocks, which then can become a, a number of different products uh, downstream. And I want to just make the point very, that is not combustion, right? You are, you want to preserve the molecules because that's the product that you're selling. So there is no combustion in that process. And the products, of course, this is not the most pretty slide, but the point is just to show, and this is from closed loop as well, the, the, the different versatility of the end products. You talked a little bit about economics, uh, Brooke, and I just wanted to say, I think really a key thing that's driving this and the interest is the recycled content commitments that have been made by over 400 brand owners globally. And a lot of these are making food contact plastics. And they're going to need advanced recycling to be able to hit these uh, recycled content commitments that include 25%, maybe 50% recycled content in their packaging. So I'd be happy to talk more about this because I think it's going to be a real driver in moving this forward and it already is. So my last slide is to talk about the investments and commitments. There's been about $5.3 billion in announcements of both advanced and mechanical recycling since China soared. But companies like Shell are leading the way. They have pledged that by 2025, they were going to be sourcing 1 million metric tons per year of plastic to use as an alternative feedstock at their chemical plants. Sabic is working with, um, with uh, Mondelez and Unilever, and they right now are producing food grade plastics utilized from advanced recycling um, that include recycled content. Eastman, their Nalgene water bottles come from advanced recycling and breaking these plastics back down to their basic chemical components. Lyndell Bissell. So I know I'm out of time here because I took the advice and set my timer, um, but I'd be happy to talk more about this. But there is a ton going on here and a lot to be excited about. And this is really going to create a circular economy. And one last thing, uh, Chevron Phillips made another announcement today um, that they are also producing circular polyethylene as well. So thank you for the time today and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate it. And thanks for setting your timer. Um, I'm going to shut mine off. Okay, next we'll hear from Andrew Hackman, who uh, is a principal lobbyist for AmeriPen. Andrew, thanks for joining us. Thanks. And can you see my screen all right? Yep. 
All right, we'll go ahead and get started. And I appreciate the opportunity, Chairman Barbe and Delegate uh, Learman. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to be with you, everybody this morning. Um, I'm Mandy Hackman on behalf of AmeriPen. AmeriPen is the trade association that represents the entire supply chain for packaging. We are material neutral, so we include both paper, plastic, glass, metal, uh, and also cover suppliers, consumer brands, companies, and those companies that deal with materials at the end of the life cycle. So we span the entire life cycle of, of packaging. One of the things, and I, it'll build a little bit off of what Craig had to say about uh, where we stand and understand where the recycling market is now. First, we, we certainly understand that there is a perception that packaging has become waste, but we do wanna continue to stress the need for packaging and reducing uh, food waste, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, particularly in light of COVID, health and sanitary reasons for, for having packaging that's effective at protecting goods and, and produce, uh, and for protecting e-commerce. As we shift more to e-commerce and this, this new reality, uh, e-commerce has certainly become a big factor of that, and getting goods effectively to the consumer uh, in this time is particularly important. We also recognize that, that the recycling market has changed. Uh, certainly with China Sword, and I know the, the, the working group has heard a bit about China Sword uh, and, and about the impact on recycling markets and commodities. Uh, we also have recognized that contamination continues to be a, a, a key driver in problems in the, the recycling space uh, and believe that there needs to be solutions that address that. Uh, and I just want to say in terms of our industry recognizing these challenges uh, about nine months ago, even before COVID, we formed a financing mechanisms task force. And that's kind of what I want to talk to the group today is about the work that's gone on in that space. First, I know the, the working group heard a bit on the last discussion about extended producer responsibility. And that certainly is a system that exists in, in Canada and in some places in Europe uh, that has, has provided funding into the recycling system. And it's an element that our financing task force is certainly focused on and tried to, to document how that might either work in the United States or challenges that exist. And a couple of the challenges that, that we've documented with extended producer responsibility, and as we think about how our industry can be part of a solution, part of financing, part of supporting the recycling system here in the US, we, we did realize that there are some inefficient, inefficient um, allocation of funding that happens in some of the EPR systems. There's new administrative costs when you create sort of a new quasi-governmental entity to, to begin to administer funds. Uh, and sometimes there's lack of incentive to modernize the recycling system and also lack of transparency. And then who controls the system? When, when you've got a new party paying for the system, who's gonna control those materials and supplies? And, and one of the big concerns in some EPR systems, we've seen reimbursement for landfilling, which we think sometimes can undermine uh, moving materials up the chain towards recycling. Uh, as our committee has looked at uh, financing, we want it to be reliable, efficient, and fair. Uh, so I won't spend much time on that because I want to make sure we get to kind of the meat of what the financing task force has looked at and talked about uh, in terms of what we want to see in a system. We want to make sure that money is actually directed towards packaging recovery. We want to make sure that funding is, is collected, perhaps at a national level, but then also is used in states to help in those programs. Uh, we want to make sure that the administrative costs are effective and fair. Uh, we want to make sure that packaging recovery and, and funding are actually tied to improve packaging recovery uh, practices. And we want to make sure that we don't duplicate what is already happening and working well, uh, public-private partnerships uh, and elements of the recycling space that are, that are working effectively. Uh, and we want to make sure that the system continues to innovate, innovate and, and address new materials as they come on, on to the, uh, the marketplace. Uh, and then we want to make sure that the funding also stays in, in an account that can't be rated for other purposes. Uh, general funds and those types of things would certainly be something that we would have concerns about. And then just to give some perspective on how we think money could, could flow from industry in a, in a system where we're participating in the recycling system, this is just a schematic of how we would, would suggest that funding could be allocated in an effective way to really help improve the system starting first with infrastructure needs and then sort of at the bottom of that hierarchy uh, funding daily gaps and in, in, in transportation and recycling. So just to give some perspective on how we would rank that. Uh, and then where are we now today? Well, like I said, we started this process back in January before COVID. We've now developed and, and this slide is linked some financing principles and objectives that are the foundation for our work continuing forward. We're in steps two and three in terms of finding common ground with other stakeholders 
and creating a structure and a model. Uh, and then our hope is that we will have a, a structure nationally that can be also uh, implemented and used at, at, at the state level. And we really wanna work with states like Maryland. Uh, we've been involved in Maine, Vermont, New York, California, Oregon, and Washington having sort of this same discussion. So appreciate the opportunity. I think I'm right about yeah. on time. So uh, I can answer any questions at the end of the group. Great, thank you so much, Andrew, I appreciate that. Um, now we're gonna move on to Zachary Taylor, who's the director of the American Recyclable Plastic Bag Association. Zachary, thanks for joining us today. Good morning, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Chair Barbe, uh, Delegate Learman. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, as noted, I am the director of the American Recyclable Plastic Bag Alliance. Uh, we represent the US manufacturers and recyclers, uh, plastic retail bags, as well as the thousands of Americans uh, they employ, uh, including some operations up in Howard County. I uh, want to highlight a couple of things about our industry, uh, bags and cells, and, and our perspective on sustainability. I think most importantly, uh, it's important to note that ARPBA and our members, we share a commitment and focus on sustainability without sustainable practices, without a sustainable product, we, we won't have a sustainable business and sustainable industry. Uh, to that point, we have adopted industry standards uh, to increase the amount of recycled content uh, in our American-made products starting next year uh, and increasing in the years ahead. Uh, we also, uh, as an industry, pioneered uh, the store take-back programs. Uh, the receptacles you see at, at most grocery stores is a place to bring back your uh, bags as well as other types of plastic film uh, to create opportunities for them to be recycled into new products. Uh, bags that go back to the store end up in new bags, composite lumber, railroad ties and, and even asphalt. Um, but, but right now more and more consumers overwhelmingly are choosing to reuse their bags, which is a great option to offset their, their impacts. Um, a study from Recycle Quebec, that's the recycling authority of the Quebec government found that about 78% of consumers choose to reuse their bags, a variety of ways, bathroom trash can liners, picking up pet waste, et cetera. Uh, and also the EPA here in the U.S. found that about 12% of bags are recycled through store collection programs. That's a, that's a number that means together, nine out of 10 bags are either getting reused or recycled. Uh, we wanna see more of that. Obviously we wanna work uh, with, with uh, groups like yourself and, and legislatures across the country to increase that, increase the, the ways that we can recycle these products. Um, and we often do hear that uh, as policies like China Sword that, uh, Recycling is ineffective, but for plastic bags and film, that's not quite correct. Uh, in 2018, 75% of plastic bags and film returned for recycling at U.S. locations, retail stores specifically, uh, were reclaimed by U.S. and Canadian recyclers. So bags and film that are returned for recycling here get recycled here uh, by and large. Uh, as I mentioned, about nine in 10 bags, we want to see more of that. Um, but before I move on, I want to add a couple of data points about bags and their prevalence in a couple of different areas. Uh, that I know have been of concern to, to this group. Um, first and foremost, uh, I want to note that the EPA data show that together all plastic bags and sacks combined account for 0.3% of municipal waste streams. Uh, plastic retail bags make up an even smaller fraction of this category. But what we also find from that is that they're going in, they're going in contaminated, and that means they're being reused. So when, when people are able to reuse their bags, study, uh, study after study on uh, their environmental impact has shown that if you reuse your bag, um, it's still the best option at checkout. Um, as it relates to litter, two recent litter studies also found, uh, done in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, not too far away, found that branded plastic retail bags account for 0.8% and 0.7% of litter respectively. Uh, and most importantly, I know this is important to, to Maryland given your unique ecosystem, but the 2020 Ocean Conservancy, data from them found that plastic grocery bags make up only 1% of beach clean material in Maryland. Now, let me be clear, um, ARPBA and our members agree, one bag disposed of improperly that ends up in the environment or the ocean, that, that's one too many. But I think as we evaluate public policy, uh, it's important to know the prevalence and to understand the issue to ensure that we can prioritize decisions uh, that will advance sustainability. And that's a goal that we wanna be a partner with uh, the state on this and, and to move forward on that. Um, as I said, you know, other things to consider in this space uh, as we look towards increasing recycling, promoting sustainability. Um, as I mentioned, every life cycle assessment has found that the plastic retail bag represents the best option at checkout for consumers in terms of environmental impact. Um, alternatives, they require additional energy to produce and transport. 
uh, offsetting the environmental benefits and, and policies that would restrict options for consumers would force consumers to use alternative products and may not have as nice of a profile. Um, for example, research from the University of Sydney into California's bag ban uh, found that when bags were prohibited, sales of thicker, heavier plastic trash bags increased. Uh, those obviously are more resource intensive uh, as consumers had to acquire alternative products uh, that would be reused. But, uh, you know, I just want to wrap up. Um, I think it's also important to note right now, um, changing the market right now uh, with policies that might restrict certain types of bags is going to put new burdens on businesses and consumers uh, at a time when they're already struggling. Bag shortages of all kinds are, are widely reported. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Your use of stat statistics was fascinating. Um, and now I'm delighted to have uh, Dr. Michael Gonsier from the University of Maryland join us. We're gonna hear from a few different folks now um, with different perspectives. Um, and then we're gonna conclude this panel by hearing from Richard Keller, who is the Recycling Marketing and Promotional Manager at the Baltimore County Department of Public Works. So we'll sort of have big picture and bring it back to what our local governments are actually dealing with. So um, Dr. Gons here, welcome. Thank you, Brooke. Um, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to be here. I feel myself a little bit more on the background maybe to fact check a few things also if you have questions. A few things we really need to talk about is the type of plastics. We haven't really touched on that because there are some plastics which are much easier to recycle than others and each has an individual um, way to be recycled. So PET or PET is one of the easier to recycle materials and it's used a lot in plastic bottles. Um, if you look at the trajectory, it's not great at the moment. We're under 9% of recycled uh, plastics in the US. That's just a very small amount. Um, well, you might wonder how much you could recycle. If you look over the pond to Europe, we are at 50% in some Baltic countries up to 70%. So just to put that in perspective, um, we also uh, need to think about phasing in other polymers, meaning now I'm talking more about bio, bio um, polymers, and they are, have their own caveats for sure, but I think they need to be in the mix. We've seen the, the market shares of PLA, polylactic acid, going up, but that is not readily biodegradable material, but it can be composted at high temperature and could be a commodity for, uh, for composting. I guess this will be the after or the later session today, but it, it buys into the concept how it's changing from specific polymers, which might be um, filling in gaps, which are occupied at the moment by more problematic uh, polymer types, which are much harder to degrade. Um, then a few things we heard about, so the mechanical um, recycling, which is typically based on sorting um, plastics and then um, putting them back into basically shredding it and trying to make another product. These are typically downcycled. What does that mean? Downcycle means you're making a less uh, quality product in a way. Um, but what we really want to achieve at least to make the same material out of it. And that's problematic for quality control of a lot of companies. I'm sure the chemical council can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but the upcycling is mostly now targeting with that chemical or we heard advanced recycling is it's a, it's a chemical recycling. It is essentially breaking those polymers apart and then really making new chemicals um, out of them on new polymers, uh, which has some very interesting advantages. It has some big challenges associated with that because typically those plants to be economical at the moment has to be very large. And now we're talking about transport of this material and so forth. So um, again, I don't wanna hold up too much um, because I really like to hear everybody uh, about the perspective, but I'm here for questions uh, later on. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Gansier, appreciate it. Um, and now we have uh, Jenny Romer, who uh, is with the Surfrider Foundation. Jenny? Sure, thank you for, for having me. And should I share my screen? If you have a presentation. Uh, I sent in the presentation. Okay, uh, Kristen or Trish, should she share her screen or do you want, do you wanna do it? Okay, Jenny, why don't you do it? Trish, okay, take, you? I thought that um, 
you were going to share it. So it'll take me a moment to bring it up. Sure. Why don't, maybe we could move on. Maybe we can come back to you then sure. um, and go to uh, Bonnie Benewal, um, who's a policy analyst uh, with Californians Against Waste. Um, Bonnie? Yeah, sure. Good morning, everyone. I'll go ahead and share my screen right now. All righty. Can everyone see that? Yep. Okay. Let's try to navigate. All right. All righty. Fantastic. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me on today. Um, my name is Bonnie Benewal. I'm a policy analyst with Californians Against Waste, and I'll be discussing California's most recent attempts at uh, curbing plastic pollution. So quick background on CAW before diving in. We're a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization based in Sacramento. We've been around for the past 43 years and have had a hand in almost all of the recycling and waste reduction policies coming out of, the, out of the state for the past four decades. So in the past four, few years, we've seen a growing surge of interest from the public around the issue of plastic pollution. Um, and I'm sure you know, you've all experienced this yourselves. So in 2015, uh, after nearly a decade of work, California passed the country's first statewide ban on single use plastic bags. A referendum on this landmark policy was subsequently put on the ballot uh, by plastic bag manufacturers, but California voters upheld the ban in November 2016. Around the same time, California also banned the use of plastic microbeads in personal care products, uh, which was later adopted nationwide. And in 2018, California passed a uh, straws upon request policy. And most recently, as in about a week ago, the governor signed uh, AB 793, which sets the world's highest standards for recycled content in plastic beverage containers. So all this is to say is that there's been a really, there's really been a growing momentum in California, both by the public and the legislature to tackle plastic pollution. But we know that we can't do this by going product by product if we really are, want to make a dent in the problem. So in 2019, California legislature introduced SB 54 and AB 1080, dubbed as the California Circular Economy and Plastic Pollution Reduction Act. The idea here was to create an overarching framework to tackle the widespread issue of plastic pollution by setting statewide goals and allowing the State Department, CalRecycle, to come up with regulations to meet those goals. So this is similar to how we tackle other large cumbersome problems, um, say greenhouse gas emissions or worker safety, by setting goals and giving state departments that are steeped in the realities of a certain issue area the authority to come up with the specific regulations to achieve those goals. So SB 54 and AB 1080 uh, set the statewide goal to reduce the waste from single use plastic packaging and products, which in these bills were defined as foodware by 75% by 2032 through source reduction, recycling and composting. It also mandated that all single use packaging products be truly recyclable or compostable, meaning that these products actually have a market on the end. They're collected, separated, bailed, and processed into new material with uh, buyers on the back end. The bills also require materials to meet certain recycling rates in order to be sold and distributed in the state. And lastly, as mentioned, uh, the bills would give CalRecycle the ability to meet these goals through a variety of mechanisms, such as setting minimum content standards and developing incentives to encourage in-state manufacturing um, using recycled material generated in the state. So we had a strong and broad coalition of supporters for these bills, uh, folks from local governments and small businesses to labor unions and of course, environmentalists. However, after a hard fought uh, two year battle, the bills came up four, four votes short on the last night of the legislative session last month and failed to pass. But this doesn't mean that the fight is over by any means. Uh, there's also been a ballot initiative proposed for the November 2022 election in California, which is very similar in 50, um, to 54 and 1080, but goes a couple of steps further. So similar to the bills, it also sets an overarching goal and gives CalRecycle the ability to come up with specific regulations to meet those goals. Um, and it mandates true recyclability and compostability. However, unlike the bills, the ballot initiative sets the goal for 25% source reduction of single use plastic. It has a ban on EPS and foodware. And last, but certainly not least, it assesses an up to one cent fee on producers for every item of single use plastic that they sell into the state. 
So the funds collected from this fee would go towards a number of different things, including local governments in order to support local recycling and composting programs, uh, towards litter abatement and uh, cleanup programs, public education, et cetera. They would also go towards uh, recycling market development programs, expanding uh, recycling and composting infrastructure in the state, uh, reusable and refillable systems and other programs of that sort. Um, and lastly, they would go towards environmental restoration projects that are for areas that are impacted by plastic pollution. So um, this is coming to the ballot in 2022. Sorry, thanks. We're going to have to, that's been five minutes and we're going to have to give, I have to be fair and give everybody a chance. But thank great. you so we'll much. Questions afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. Um, great. So now we'll go back to Jenny um, from the Plastic Pollution Initiative and the Surfrider Foundation. Sure. Great. Sorry about that delay. I'm Jenny Romer with the Surfrider Foundation. Let me make this a little bigger for everyone. And the Surfrider Foundation is dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the world's oceans, beaches. Um, oceans, waves, and beaches through a powerful grassroots activist network. It kind of shows you where we are located. Uh, we're in Maryland. We have regional staff and the chapter there. Uh, and we have 82 chapters in the US and 95 youth clubs. So I'm here to talk about plastics legislation. I'm quickly going to run through what I call the trifecta of simple plastics laws. So that's bags, foam, straws, before moving on to talking about the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Uh, Surfrider has a plastic Just bag Just as a law. reminder, you only have five minutes. Yep. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, Surfrider has a plastic bag law activist toolkit. Uh, so I recommend uh, checking that out, really gets into the nitty gritty details of bag laws. I will say that the um, Bag Association spoke earlier, really is a main lobbyist group um, for the ba plastic bag industry in the US and spends millions of dollars on lobbying. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. And a lot of the statistics used were really cherry picked. I recommend going to plasticbaglaws.org slash effectiveness to check out a variety of effectiveness studies and um, should be all of the effectiveness studies in the world compiled by NYU scientists. So the, a map of bag laws, Washington just passed their statewide law. Um, so it should be dark blue now. Um, here's the effectiveness spreadsheet, plasticbaglaws.org slash effectiveness. Uh, foam foodware, we've seen, we are now see laws in four states, including your own, um, and hundreds of local laws across the country. With straws, we've, we see statewide laws in two states, hundreds of local laws. Upon request is the best policy. So the, and then beverage containers, we have beverage container laws in 10 states in Guam. Oregon's bill is the best model. Um, so we've we've gotten through, or we've we've really figured out what to do with specific products so far. And so what the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act does is really take all of those policies that we've seen work well across the country, put them into one national bill, and then really build upon that. So we're including all of those policies we, we've already talked about, but then we're also including. But I see the most important things, um, the really bigger picture things are banning the export of plastic waste so that it all has to be processed domestically. And that really can stimulate uh, real recycling markets domestically, stimulate jobs and make it so that we have a, a transparent waste system. And then the probably the most, most exciting thing is the extended producer responsibility portion. So EPR extended, or some people just call it producer responsibility or producer pays, um, is something that we're talking about a lot at the state level. What Bonnie was talking about earlier, um, some would consider that a form of producer responsibility. Um, and so generally that is the packaging must meet certain criteria and optional criteria, including higher levels of post-consumer recycled content are incentivized, producers have to pay into a fund for the cost of recycling, disposal, and cleanup of their product packaging. And that money, that money is either managed by the producers through a producer responsibility organization or reimbursed to local governments for, for that work. And the, the thing here, the main, the main um, part is 
shifting that responsibility from local governments for paying for all of this to the producers. And so like Bonnie mentioned, that one cent fee could be something similar to that. But if the, if the packaging is more sustainable, then the fee is a little bit less. And then there's also a pause on permits for new plastics, plastic production facilities under the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. Um, and I will say that uh, we worked with Senator Udall's office to create a memo to state legislators on how to incorporate parts of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act or the whole thing into bills to be introduced at the state level. So I'd be happy to share that um, and I will see you the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Now I'm going to turn it over to Richard Keller from uh, Baltimore County Department of Public Waste or uh, Department of Public Works and to just bring it home um, all of these big facts and interesting uh, and important information to where the rubber meets the road uh, on the ground here in Maryland. So Richard, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Am I, is my screen on or not? Uh, a picture of you is, but there's no shared screen. All right, hang on a minute. Okay. If you sent it to Trish or Kristen, maybe one of them could pull it up too. Trish, are you on? Or Kristen, do we either of you have- I'm on, I don't have the okay. uh, PowerPoints. Kristen does, so okay. I'll check with her. There, there we go. <laughs> Here we go, Richard. All right. Um, somehow or other, I've lost, I've lost my place in the meeting, so. Um, Whoop, <laughs> he just, <laughs> did he just disappear? Somehow I've been, I'm trying to get back into the meeting. Give me a second. No, you're here, Richard, you're here. We just need you to speak. You're, you're on, don't worry. You're, okay. and we have your presentation, don't worry. All right. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Richard Keller. I'm with the Baltimore County Bureau of Solid Waste Management Recycling Division. And I'm here today to talk about market development. Next slide. Kristen, can you advance it? Thanks. Just scroll down, I think. Great, thank you. Okay. So today I want to be talking, I want to talk about the importance of recycling markets. Recycling is a three-step process. It is collection and processing, manufacturing new products, and then using new products. As we heard, have heard often today, we are trying to create a circular economy. We generally do a good job at collection and processing, but need more attention to manufacturing new products and buying recycled products. And in order for recycling to reach its full potential, all three elements must be in, bal in balance. Collection alone is not recycling. Next slide. So last year, uh, Baltimore County drafted House Bill 1452 on behalf of the Maryland Recycling Network. The bill was introduced by Delegate Stein, passed the House Environment and Transportation Committee and the House unanimously. But the bill did not pass the Senate due to COVID-19. Next slide. So let me walk through the key provisions of the bill. First, the bill provides leadership through the Department of the Environment Office of Recycling. And the main goal of the bill, and this is a quote from the bill, is to promote the development of markets for recycled materials and recycled products in the state. And the concept is to evaluate markets and make recommendations to improve markets and also to reduce contamination, which is critical to offering large quantities of quality materials. 
The bill also will identify materials that are the largest portion of the waste stream and those needing markets, which would certainly include plastics. It is designed to identify businesses that use recycled materials, including reuse, repair, and remanufacturing, to identify opportunities for existing businesses, and then offer methods to attract new recycling businesses, including financing. The campaign slogan in the bill is, Maryland is open for recycling business. The other important part of the bill is the coordination that needs to go on between MDE, other state agencies, local governments, and private organizations. First, MDE would work with the Department of Commerce on expanding use in existing businesses and attracting new businesses. The Department of General Services to expand buy recycled efforts. The Department of Transportation to use recycled materials in road projects and the Maryland Environmental Service and Maryland Waste Disposal Authority to develop new recycling projects. Next slide. In conclusion, while we need to collect more clean recyclables, supply alone will not increase recycling. We need to determine the options for current Maryland businesses and new businesses to use more recycled materials. We need the state, local governments, institutions, and private businesses to use more recycled product. Only through these efforts can Maryland expand recycling. We need to pass a 2021 version of HB 1452 and make Maryland open for recycling business. Thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Richard. Really appreciate you joining us today. Um, so now I'm gonna um, open it up and start with Chairman Barve. Thank you very much, sorry. I, uh, I just wanted to make one comment. Uh, a couple of people made uh, comments about bills that may not have passed in the General Assembly. And uh, I just want to assure you that if a bill passed my committee, um, my intention is to take it up in the form in which it passed my committee almost as quickly as we can at the beginning of session. And so uh, I know that we've got a, a stewardship bill and we have other pieces of legislation. My intention is to have those sponsors pre-file their bills in the state at which they passed our committee so that we can get going right off the bat because who knows how long the next session will be. And thank you, Brooke, for letting me interject that at the beginning of the questions. Of course, no, I think it's important for everybody to know um, and set expectations. So thank you for that. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna go in the order in which the questions were received and start with Delegate Love. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to all the presenters. Um, Madam Chair, if it's okay, I have two questions. Sure. One each for two different folks. Um, Craig, you talked about advanced recycling and everything that goes into that. Um, Chair Learman began by talking about the economics of recycling and how right now it's more expensive than creating virgin products. So that really begs the question, are companies really going to spend all the money to recycle when it's just cheaper to extract virgin products? And why not just make less plastic. Sure. Um, well, <clears throat> first, let me kind of answer that last part is, is plastic helps sort of have reductions, right? Um, well, yes. I'm, and, and we don't need to go into all the benefits of plastics because you and I could point counterpoint, we don't need a single use container of cut broccoli. So sure. let's not go there. <laughs> let's go directly to my question, please. Okay. So, um, so your question is, is about uh, recycling economics. Um, and certainly we know that, um, you know, economics have been challenged for recycling, right? I mean, uh, there's, you know, like you said, sort of lower energy prices. Um, there's China Sword, which used to, you know, China used to be a, um, a destination for a lot of um, plastics and, and other materials, paper as well. Um, and they shut down their markets back in 2017, 2018. And of course, there's a challenges on the front end with collection. So let me first say, I just, you know, kind of this is, there's an, Important parts in the whole chain here is a couple of days ago there was an announcement from the recycling partnership in which they have come out with a, a proposal um, sort of similar to some of the producer responsibility proposals around packaging fees right and sort of to assess fees on packaging all materials uh, plastics metal uh, paper aluminum glass and we joined that so with 18 other 17 other organizations um, so we are for uh, fees on packaging 
um, that would pay for the basic infrastructure, right? Help with the education, the collection, and the access. Um, I think the key part of the, the recycling uh, partnerships uh, proposal is that it would still leave local governments in charge of their, you know, recycling and, and waste operations, right, where they should be. Um, and additionally, they have advocated for a disposal tax to sort of try to bring up the cost of disposal to help sort of equalize the economics. So I just want to make sure the committee recognizes that and the work group that that's something that, that we would encourage you all to work with the recycling partnership and others on because it can certainly help the economics on the front end around collection and access. Secondly, yeah, we believe, you know, Chevron Phillips had a big announcement today that they're the, the first U.S. company to produce um, circular uh, polyethylene. So these are, are harder to recycle plastics that are broken back down in their basic chemical components and brought back to uh, Chevron Phillips to then displace a virgin feedstock. And again, I think what's really driving this um, is, you know, number one is consumers. Consumers want their packaging A, to be recyclable and B, um, to um, to in contain recycled content. And that's why you're seeing over 400 different brand owners that have committed to doing that. And so, yeah, we are, are at sort of the, the, the beginning stages of this, but from Mondelez with their Philly cream cheese tubs between Unilever and their Magnum ice cream tubs, Eastman with their Nalgene water bottles, the products that Chevron Phillips will soon be um, selling. We're seeing sealed air put in um, into cheese packaging, recycled content. So those economics and the ability to meet those sustainability targets that, that brand owners have that want to be the ones that are selling these products are really going to drive this, this forward. Additionally, you know, government has a role here too. Um, you know, some of the speakers talked about recycled content. You know, we're happy to have that conversation. We think government can be helpful in that regard is thinking about how you encourage recycled content and products. Just we want to make sure that, um, that, uh, that you know, advanced recycling has a role there because it's a critical role, especially when it comes to these food contact uh, packaging. Okay, thank you. Um, and my second question is for Andrew. Actually, Craig, you, you had a, a nice lead into my second question talking about local governments. Um, Andrew, we heard a lot from local governments and the pressure that is put on them from the excess plastic that we have. Um, in coming up with your policy position on recycling, did you consult with any state or local governments or even haulers or MRF operators? And if so, which ones? Yeah, so in terms of consulting with, with different states, We've had conversations with Maine, Oregon, Washington State uh, in terms of getting some perspective on their vision for the financing proposal. In terms of haulers, uh, waste management's a member of ours, so we've got that sector included in our membership. Uh, and in terms of local governments, we've had engagement with folks from different cities like Seattle, et cetera, in, in conversations. We're still moving that process forward. We're getting agreement within different parts of the, the industry sector that are our membership right now and then continuing to move that out to states and local governments. So it's a continuing part of our, our plan to get buy-in on the financing mechanisms uh, proposal that we hope to see out in states in the future. Got it, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And since you're talking, um, I just wanna sort of follow up with you um, on, on that issue. Um, uh, Andrew, could you talk a little bit about, you said there were a few states that have introduced bills. Could you talk a little bit about what elements of the bills in the various different states um, your member align with your member's uh, mm -hmm. vision? Yeah, so um, there's probably about seven to 10 states that have introduced different versions of an extended producer responsibility bill. I'll focus on Maine first. I, I know you heard from um, Sarah Nichols, who's yep. involved in that discussion in Maine. We were involved in that as well. Um, the, 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 the idea about empowering a product stewardship organization to begin to meet goals and to, to create a funding structure where we support the system is something where we agree. I think that there's lots of small decisions within how that program is going to be structured. One concern that we had in Maine was reimbursement for landfilling. That was really a red line for us because when local governments aren't getting reimbursement for landfilling now, it still is the cheapest option to landfill materials. So we had concerns with, with there being reimbursement for landfilling. Uh, we also wanted to understand 
where the lines were going to be drawn in terms of who sets the fees, how the fees are approved by the department. And some of those are down in the weeds things, uh, but there was progress moving forward on, on some of those uh, aspects. Um, there's legislation in New York uh, in the Senate. There are two different versions, uh, assembly version and a Senate version. I think the Senate version is probably closer towards getting towards a, something we're working on. Um, they, I think, vest more authority in the product stewardship organization in developing fees and a structure that works for those that are paying into the producer part of the system. Um, Oregon right now is still coming out with an outline. We've, we've had a lot of discussions with Oregon. They have probably the most extensive database around sustainable materials management. So understanding that we um, try to find the best outcome for a particular material, we consider lots of different factors in that. So Oregon's done a lot of work in that. We're still anxiously kind of waiting to see what their outline is going to look like. That's supposed to be out, I think, in the next month or next couple of weeks. Um, so, so Oregon didn't have a bill, uh, but their DEQ process is moving forward with, with something and we anticipate that that's going to be legislation next year. Uh, I'll just say at the start, no state last year passed an extended producer responsibility bill. So we do have lots of kind of different moving pieces of elements that, that could work here and there. Maine probably got the farthest along, uh, but also had some pretty critical fundamental flaws, which is why it didn't pass at the end of, uh, of, of session in Maine. Does that help? That helps. It sounds like 2021 will be a big year for EPR. Um, okay, uh, let's move on. Delegate Boyce. Thank you so much, Delegate Learman. Um, uh, I had a couple of questions. Let me go back to my notes. I wanted to go to um, Mr. Hackman. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for um, a lot of the interesting information that you brought us. Um, you mentioned um, your process, your playing process, and that it began earlier this year that you were in steps two or three, two and three, mm -hmm. um, kind of building the structure and the infrastructure um, to somewhat kind of build a national structure. And I, I think I missed it, but when do you plan to have kind of all the pieces together to kind of put forward? Yeah, so yeah, we are in that that consultative process and moving our outline out and beginning to flesh in, you know, quite frankly, I'm sure everybody on this committee is interested in what's the legislative language going to look like. So we're hoping to have an outline uh, by the end of October, early November. Obviously, each state is going to have sort of a different um, statutory structure. So, you know, that's going to probably depend on states. Uh, but by the end of the year, our goal is to have, you know, an outline that we can use legislatively uh, to get us to that next step. Uh, so that, that's kind of the timing question. Was there another question there? I may have forgotten. I'm really sorry. No, that was that was it. So okay. I, so your, your, your planning process should be done then and hopefully maybe um, having, uh, depending on the state and the legislature, yep. 2021 legislation. Yeah, to, to Delegate Learman's point, next year is going to be a busy year and we're ready. To yeah, I'm that. excited about it. I can't wait. Um, thanks so much. Um, my next question is for um, Mr. Taylor. Um, you talked about um, you talked about adopting standards for American made products. And um, I wanted to you to expand a bit on that and talk about then the percentage of products that you make received that are not American made and what happens to those? Yeah, thank you, Delegate. I appreciate the question. Uh, the American Recyclable Plastic Bag Alliance, we represent the US-based manufacturers and recyclers of plastic retail bags. So my members make uh, bags right here in the United States. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'm completely understanding your question, but the bags, uh, the standards we set for, for our group to increase recycled content starting uh, in 2021, uh, are for my members bags from right here. So in other words, you only are specifically collecting your specific bags, your bags. No, uh, I'm, kinda, I'm confused. That's why I've been asking. No, happy, happy to clear, happy to answer that. Um, and apologies for, for any confusion that I've caused. No, it's me. Uh, my members helped establish the store take back programs at retailers across the country. Uh, they didn't want to see their products. Uh, and other plastic films going directly into the landfills without a reuse um, or without a, a, a new end life. Uh, so we work with retailers to collect 
bags, whether they're our bags or other uh, film plastic bags. And then we take them back to our facilities, uh, turn them into new bags, deposit lumber, railroad ties, wh whoever, and that's the end market for those products. So our bags on the front end, we've, like I said, we've established new um, standards to increase the recycled content. As, you know, we know that's something that's important to consumers uh, and our customers. Uh, but we're also taking plastic film that we can that's recycled at the store. So whether that's dry cleaning bags and, and other similar types of plastic materials. Um, so not just our bags on the recycling end, but as a part of the standards just for, for uh, our members as that applies to. Thanks so much. And I just, I just want to finish by saying this. I, I try to run and go into my collection of plastic bags. And so, um, you know, you mentioned, quote unquote, reuse, but reuse as it relates to, you know, me potentially using this thin bag to pick up dog waste or to use as a, a, a liner. Um, but there's a difference between, and I think this goes back to the doctor's point, between this and this, right? This bag, I'm sure I've had for years because it's strong. I'm less likely to throw this out. This, the stuff that they sell in the store, have to double and triple to carry groceries. If, for instance, if I'm walking or if I'm taking the bus, so on and so forth. And so, really want to talk about um, recycling. As are, are you getting these bags? Or are you getting these bags? Or are you hoping not to get these bags because these, the life cycle? I mean, it's it's cheap. I mean, it, it's it's cheap. And so, really wanted to talk about the type of bags that you're actually getting and what's kind of being recycling and going back to what can be recycled and what can be recycled as it relates to, you know, the quick and dirty, it's, this is what I call a cheap product because it doesn't last. Yes, I can use it again as a trash liner, but I can't use this a third or fourth time. This, I can. Matter of fact, I have a bag I was trying to look for that I've had since 2016 that I've gotten from a store in California that asked people to not only pay for the bag, but they say you can actually reuse that bag when you come back to the grocery store. I've held on to it for a long time to kind of make a point that I still have that bag. And when we're talking about reuse, reuse as relates to cheap disposable plastics versus something that potentially lasts a bit longer. Yeah, so both are made of polyethylene and both are recyclable. And we collect both and, and happily recycle them into, into new bags. Um, let's be clear that they're not recyclable in Maryland. No. Um, our unit, there is no municipal recycling of plastic bags available in the state of Maryland. One and two, I'm just curious about the types of bags that you actually collect. So the store take back programs receive film that consumers bring back to the store, both types of bags that you outlined. Um, if they're made of, of thin film polyethylene or thicker film polyethylene as your bag from California, most likely is it's hard for me to know without, without being able to see it. Um, but they're both, they are both 100% recyclable. Well, I'm saying that to say, so for instance, in, in, in Baltimore City and in, in I, you know, the bag bill that we passed, um, well, in almost in, um, in, in Maryland, it went by the, the mills, right? And so, the, you know, so in, in Baltimore City, they lowered it. So essentially what I would call the cheaper, thinner plastic was the lower mills, but the higher mills is the, the thicker plastic the plastic that is usually like that department store type of bag or or higher. And so I'm just, I'm curious about the the mill, the mill. So are you getting the one mill bags more than you're getting the four or five mill bag? I, I'm just curious about the type of bag the consumer actually takes back to a store and recycle, or is that something that you just don't uh, keep count of? I don't think I have that information in front of me, Delgate, but I'd be more than happy to get that to you. I'd appreciate uh, it if you have happy, it. Happy to. Thanks happy so to much. I digress. I'm done. I think that Jenny might have a point that she wanted to make too, because she's in, I don't know. Jenny, do you want to add to that? It looked like you were trying to add something in the chat. I'm sure. Yeah, I've been rather active in the chat. <laughs> so um, I will say that with the, the Bag Association, uh, they are offering kind of voluntary commitments for their manufacturers for recycled content, but really Sir Fighter recommends 
bag laws include post-consumer recycled content mandates. And so really the only way to drive real recycling of plastic film is to require those mandates. So California's law requires that the film reusable bags have 40% post-consumer recycled content. And that bill was put on hold for 60 days. A lot of things were put on hold due to COVID for an, because of an executive order. And, um, and orders for bags with recycled content just completely crashed during that time. So that shows that really mandating that recycled content is the way to drive a market for plastic film recycling. And at Surfrider, we're really focused on reduction of single-use plastics, but then we want to have the recycling system work for everything that's left. And I believe a lot of the stats that Mr. Taylor were using, was using were based on film recycling generally, not retail carry out bags specifically. Um, and so that's a much smaller percentage. Um, and I believe he's relying on the stats from the EPA, which don't really sort out what carry out bags versus films generally. So thank you. I wanted to point that out as well. Thanks. Thank you. We have still a number of people with questions, so we're going to keep moving along. Uh, Delegate Holmes, thanks for joining us today. Yes, indeed. Uh, first off, I want to bring you all greetings from beautiful Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you the truth, I can't wait to get back to Maryland. Uh, <laughs> my, a question for uh, Dr. Goncior, who initiate, initially started talking about the chemical breakdown of plastic bags and how after time, the breakdown of the bags becomes less and less valuable uh, for another end product to use for another end product. Uh, so if the, and I want you to expand upon that because if the, in my mind, if the value of the recyclable re material is of no value in the end point, then banning the bag on the front part seems to make more sense to me. So explain to me how the process works and what the value is of the end product uh, after the, the chemical process that you began to explain. Sure. Um, so um, if you think about it, it's, it's a quality control issue because depending on what you use the polymer or the plastic for, it needs to maintain a specific minimum quality, right? So if you think about plastics, it's recycled, there's grease on there, there are, there are prints, there, there are pigments on there, there's a lot of contamination goes along with this. So when you just physically recycle this material, then you, you end up with an impurities, what we call it. That means these are chemicals or even inorganic material that ends up in the material no matter what you do. So the quality goes down. Now, depending on what you're doing, but you can't essentially almost, you can probably do it with some polymers to recycle it to the same material, but only a few rounds. Um, let's say with PET, it's probably more like six, seven times. In Europe, they've expanded to 20 times. But with other materials, uh, to make bottles again. Now I'm talking about plastic bottles for drinking. Um, but eventually, this material is just not going to be recycled anymore to make bottles. So then that material can be downcycled. That's what the term is. You cycle it into a lower quality product. Well, let's say you're making a plastic bag that doesn't need to be high purity, right? So that's a different issue in a way. But regardless of this, eventually even the, the, the polymer, if it's recycled a lot of times, uh, is gonna probably not be reused or recycled anymore. So this is the mechanical part of it. The chemical recycling we heard first today or the advanced recycling essentially is a different approach. It, it takes different, even different types of polymer. Um, so the sorting is still very important, but less important in a way, because you're making, you're breaking it down essentially. You're breaking that entire molecule, the plastic bag down into chemicals, uh, smaller, smaller chemicals, and then they re, re, uh, redesign chemically to make another polymer, chemically speaking. So there are two different issues. However, um, Again, we're still not very far with the chemical recycling, to be honest, and on a large scale. So recycling facilities and sortings, those who are focused more on the, on the, on the physical side of things, meaning on the, on the, on the uh, mechanical recycling side. But I mean, the, the, the idea really is to try to make the same product again, which is on the long run, probably only 
feasible if you are chemically recycling it. Does that help? It, it, it does. It does. And uh, like, I, like I tell my committee all the time, I just love stoichiometry. <laughs> um, and if I, if, if I could, Madam Chair, yeah. uh, ask another question to uh, Mr. Sure. Uh, Keller uh, and, and perhaps maybe even Doug Stein as well. Uh, Mr. Keller talked about the 2021 version of the Baltimore County bill that was passed. And I'm just curious to know what that 2021 version is gonna look like and how is it different from the 2020 version? Um, uh, Richard, if you don't mind, I'll jump in and say- Sure. Identical. And look, I've, I've requested a, a version of it that's identical. Thank you. Uh, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, thank you very much, Delegate Holmes, and safe travels back to Maryland. Um, Delegate Tarasa. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we've talked a lot about recycling, but uh, my question for Dr. Gontior is, how are these plastic, really, how are the plastics getting into the environment, and where are they found, and what are, what what the challenge is? What is? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah. So um, there are a multitude of pathways for plastic to enter the environment. Um, in the aquatic environment and, and stormwater runoff is one of the biggest issues we're facing. So if you look at data now published in the Chesapeake Bay, it's coming out more and more in some groups. They're finding mostly fibers and small, small pieces. So they're actually already breaking down in our waterways alone. We have data from the from Data, um, plastic collection like the Baltimore Treasury, for example, would really show the polystyrene issue there, right? Because this is really a light material which is transported very easily. So um, in terms of polymers, um, it reflects the most produced polymers. So mostly polyethylene and PET bottles, of course, entering the environment. How they break down. So they actually do get brittle over time because they are, the polymer is softened by UV light. So this is uh, essentially, I'm not sure if you ever had a lawn chair out of plastics and let it outside for years and you broke down with it eventually. I had that experience a few times. This is what I'm talking about, it gets brittle. And that is because the, the actual structure of the polymer is degraded and it, it breaks down in smaller and smaller pieces. And that's what we call microplastics. Um, we have a huge issue with um, fibers as well. So there's a lot of data now on very small plastic fibers. And these are more related to not what we're talking about in terms of recycling material, but from clothing as well. So we're, we're um, polyester fibers largely. So there are, there are multiple um, pathways to enter the environment. Unfortunately, breaking down to smaller pieces is, is really um, the biggest problem because it's, it's, it's a very difficult um, to clean up things like that. Does that help a little bit, Jen? Yes, um, but what, so what is the challenge then in getting it back? Then what is the challenge? I think that the, the, the real challenge is that we have to keep it out of all the waterways. That means we have to make, do a better job to keep it out of the landfills. And, and if, you, if you look around when, when trash is transported alone, we have a lot, I mean, I live in Southern Maryland, right? And I see quite a lot of times trash flying off, even, even transporting um, trucks. Um, and, and we will see it all the time. We also see that trash ends up next to the roadways all the time. And plastic, unfortunately, is one of the most mobile part of the trash in general, right? So it's light material and it can, can be very easily transported. Um, we have even now evidence that wind transports more, more, more particles to, ex to extend. We never expected this. So there are huge stories with that. So I think we have to find a way to keep it out of the environment and recycling and to better control where it goes is a big uh, way forward, especially of light materials like plastic bags, you know, they even fly miles if you let them. I mean, I'm not sure if you visited recently a landfill and the fencing around it, it has, it has a lot of plastics back hanging in it just because of that. Thank you. Interesting. So we have two more, uh, two more delegates with questions and then we're gonna move on to the next panel. Um, Delegate Stein and then Delegate Clark. Delegate Stein. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is about the use of the recycling logo. Um, the FTC's green guidelines specify that a product should be advertised as being recyclable only if 60% of the area's recycling facilities are able to, to accept that product. And we've heard in these briefings from at least one recycling director who said, who complained about the volume of plastic products uh, that are sold in Maryland with recycling logo, but are not recyclable in Maryland. And there was one specific item that he pointed to the plastic cups with the recycling logo and the number six on them. Um, apparently they're, they're everywhere in Maryland. They show up in their curbside collections, but they're not recyclable. So my question is for the industry, how closely do the plastic manufacturers adhere to the FTC green guidelines on, um, on advertising that something's recyclable? Sure, I could, I take, I could take that. Um, I guess I would ask just sort of a clarifying question. I'm, I'm wondering if, if what they mean is the chasing arrows symbol on the bottom of this. Yes. Um, okay, so that's actually doesn't necessarily mean that something is um, recyclable in terms of the FTC sort of um, regulations. That just is a resin identification code um, that that tells what the the, the resin is. Um, so rather to market your, uh, uh, your, your package, your cup, your whatever as recyclable, um, that's a different sort of, um, that's, a, that's a different uh, label that a brand owner would place on its, um, on its packaging. So there's, there's actually a little bit of a, a difference there. So the, 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 the chasing arrows number six is really just identifying that as number six uh, polystyrene. But the chasing arrows yeah, but that's, to, yeah, sorry, to, to mean that something is recyclable. I mean, by definition, that that the consumer interprets that as, as saying that something is recyclable. I mean, there wouldn't be a, a separate statement on the cup saying recyclable or not recyclable. There are actually. Um, the, the Sustainable Packaging Coalition has created what's called the How to Recycle Label. And so they work off the green guides and the, the access numbers um, so that brand owners can put different types of labels on their, on their packaging, such as, you know, either it's recyclable or check locally or not recyclable. Um, so, but I, I, I agree with your point that there is certainly confusion with the resin identification codes and what those mean. Um, and it, it's up to industry and all of us, I think, to do a better job of of sort of educating the consumer better and, and sort of figuring figuring that out. Um, interestingly enough, the the green guides are up for renewal um, in 2022. So a lot of these discussions will be um, you know on the on the table in the, in the uh, that upcoming uh, um, FTC discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Jenny ha is adding information in the chat that California codified the FTC's green guide. Interesting. Um, and uh, Delegate Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Delegate Holmes, I'll be waving to you in about 15 minutes going past you on I-80 here at Cleveland. But uh, uh, my question is, uh, when we start talking about the, East, uh, the EMR, uh, it always gives me a little bit of a hiccup because I, when we start putting more liabilities on companies, to me, that starts to equate into more cost to the consumer. And I guess the gentleman that uh, was talking about the uh, EMR, uh, just uh, what is his thoughts on that? It is, is that uh, extended liability, is that going to cost the consumers more or where would that money come from? that they would use uh, to set up uh, funds for uh, recycling and stuff. Was that a question for me, I think, maybe? I think yes. that's for you, yep. Okay, yeah. yeah, I'll jump in. Yeah, certainly cost to consumer is, is an aspect that we've evaluated and are, are trying to get a, a full understanding on with extended producer responsibility. It has been a concern that, that when you layer and create a new quasi-governmental entity that's solely responsible for this, that's going to create administrative costs. And it's also tough to, to differentiate costs differently per state, which is why we're trying to develop a model that's efficient and fair and also organized at the national level that can plug in at the state level. So we're not having to create 
you know, a Maryland extended producer responsibility corporation, a Maine extended producer responsibility corporation, where you have those administrative costs duplicated state per state, and that will drive up uh, costs for consumers. So we're working on it. Um, I, I can't say that there won't be any change to, to cost of goods. That's obviously something that the market determines. Uh, but our ideas around an extended producer responsibility system that works for producers is to try to make that as efficient as possible and also deliver funds out to local governments and those projects that improve recycling as fast as possible versus having a five-year regulatory process that, that has to make lots of decisions. We want the system to be flexible with as much power vested in the product stewardship organization to, to make the right efficient decisions as possible to try to reduce any cost, increase in cost to consumers. So that's that's just our perspective on it. One Thank real you. quick, one real quick follow-up question uh, to that. Uh, my experience in local government in a short time in state government compared to uh, a lot of folks on the call is that when we set up groups like this at a local level, the funding sources maybe in the beginning tend to be pretty good and, and handle uh, what we need to do to take care of issues, whether it's recycling or, or what it is. But uh, I, I think as we move forward on something like that, we need to make sure when we create these local entities that uh, there's some kind of mandated funding to go to them because otherwise it, it's going to fall back on the, on the taxpayers of the state or the, the citizens, plus it's going to fall back on the consumer. So our citizens are going to be paying for the whole thing. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that. And, and, you know, I want to watch that very closely as the costs go forward. Uh, do you have any ideas on how we could achieve that? So yeah, one, one thing to offer, and it was in the slide, but is to, to try to make sure that the funding that flows into an extended producer responsibility organization is dedicated and can't be, quite frankly, put into the general fund and rated for other purposes. We saw that uh, Florida had an advanced recycling program in the late 1990s that continued into the early 2000s. And I think around 2002 or 2003, that money was siphoned off into the general fund and then the program disappeared and was sunsetted. So I, I, our interest certainly is to make sure that the funding remains dedicated to the purpose in which producers would provide for it. So it really is key from our perspective to make sure that it is a dedicated fund that can't be used for other purposes. We've also seen that with litter taxes in Washington where they're collecting litter taxes now, but that funding is not staying at the Department of Ecology in Washington to actually combat litter, that money has now flowed back into the general fund and being used to plug budget holes. And I, I certainly understand this group has got to make budget decisions and, and the legislature uh, has a tough challenge in that area. But if we're going to pay, you know, it set expectations that, that the system is going to be improved via legislation, it really is key that this funding remains dedicated in this area. Thank you very much. You gave the exact answer I was hoping you would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, now I'm going to turn it over to Chairman Barve, who has some um, cleanup questions. Great. Uh, cleanup. Ha ha. I see what you did there. Um, uh, I, I have a question for uh, Michael Goncior. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Um, um, and it's this. Um, obviously, when it comes to plastic, plastic is very, very difficult to recycle. And um, it's either landfilled or incinerated. Now, I'm not gonna get into why incineration is a bad thing, but let's talk about landfilling of plastic. How harmful, you may not know the answer to this and you may have to get back to me, but what does the literature say about the degradation of plastics in landfills? Uh, what do we know about that? Wow, that is actually a difficult question to answer because as you know, when we talk about plastics, we're mingling all polymers together. Okay, so um, when we talk about polyethylene, uh, it probably is not a big problem because it's a short, it's a, you know, carbo, it's a, it's a carbon hydrogen chain. So it's uh, also um, toxicologically not a problem. If you're talking about aromatics like styrene, polystyrene or polyvinyl chloride, which has a chlorine atom, then it's a different story. The breakdown of this could surely lead to some organic 
halogens or organochlorines. We're actually interesting that you asked. We did just a recent study on landfill leachate. And I've never seen a more complex mixture of organics in anywhere I looked in dissolved organic matter around the world. So this is just putting into context. Plus, over almost a thousand compounds we've seen which have a chlorine at it. So of course, I can't say that they're coming from the plastics, but they're coming from everything which is landfilled. So that comes to the point at that um, it remains problematic um, to put plastics in landfill, um, depending on the mixture you're putting in there. So that's why, especially with PVC, which is actually recyclable, and there is a big effort in Europe right now, actually an oversight by the industry itself, they created their own oversight to recycle plastic. They started about 18 years ago and are now at 800,000 tons of PVC, rigid PVC recycled. The, the PVC, again, the soft PVC, which you might know from your balloons or from your water toys is even more problematic. That lifestyle, lifetime is not very long and they are full of plasticizers. To make it soft, PVC would be without those very rigid, that's your piping in your house. But the soft material has a lot of um, problematic uh, plasticizers. You might have heard the term phthalates. This is a, a group of compounds which have been very well documented. We have actually endocrine disrupting hormone mimicking properties, and they're also in, in, in the, uh, ending up in the landfill. So it remains a problematic part, but not all plastics. So again, this is a, this is a question you have really to ask um, which polymer is ending up in, in the landfill. Well, I'd like to see whatever literature you have and you can send it to our committee so that we, uh, the members of the committee can review that. Uh, yeah. Another question I have is for, I, I, well, I don't know who to direct this to, and that is uh, when we consider the different types of plastic that are disposed of in the waste stream, do we have a sense of what percentage is this type versus that type? Has anybody done a pie chart like that for us to see uh, what, you know, what the waste stream looks like in terms of its quantity? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, the, the US EPA does track, um, you know, the uh, recycling. They put out a, a report every year called the uh, Advancing Sustainable Materials uh, Management. And, and I think, you know, earlier was said that there is a, a lower plastics rate, obviously, in, in the US um, for plastic packaging. It's, I think, 13 or 14, per, uh, about, yeah, 13 percent. Um, most of that is plastic bottles. So your PET soda water bottles are recycled about a 30 percent rate and your high density polyethylene uh, milk jugs and detergent bottles are uh, recycled at uh, about a 30 percent rate uh, as well. Um, film plastics that are also recycled tend to be either uh, low density polyethylene or high density polyethylene. And polypropylene was, was um, doing well from a, the standpoint there's no uh, polypropylene recycling rate that I know of, um, but, uh, but it has been sort of a bit of a casualty um, from, uh, from China Sword where a lot of these you know, three through seven plastics were sent overseas um, to be to re be recycled over there. However, there's a real focused effort. I don't know if folks saw, but the Recycling Partnership rolled out their polypropylene recycling coalition this summer, which is right now sort of directly investing in sortation um, in uh, materials recovery facilities to get at that that polypropylene. So um, you know, we can maybe be helpful, Mr. Chairman, by um, you know sending along some of these rates and and sort of helping the committee with uh, what what the EPA tracks. The American Chemistry Council we also track. Um, plastics recycling, we do annual reports. We do an all bottles report. We do a, a bags, film and wraps report and a non bottle rigids report as well that get to at least the, the, the amounts and types of plastics that are, that are recycled every year. Okay, um, I do have one final question before I get to that. Kristen, if you can find that re report that the EPA does on the percentage of plastics in the waste stream, uh, I'd appreciate that, I'd like to see that. And finally to uh, Richard Keller, um, I believe you have single source, uh, uh, single stream sing, uh, recycling. Um, does dual stream make more sense? Um, the, the short answer is, let me, let me put my screen back on. Um, we are so, so far down the road in terms of the investment and in terms of the, um, 
of what we have done with 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 the county and with residents that really at this point we can't turn back to, to dual stream. Okay, asked and answered. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. I'm done. Great. Well, thank you. Um, thank you to everybody for your presentations. And uh, now we are going to move on to our second panel, um, which is about composting and organics recycling. We'll be hearing from Stephen Birchfield, Ann Dratty, Chaz Miller, Peter Ettinger, Linda Norris Walt, Justin Garrity, Marvin Hayes, Ben Perry, and Mark Hollick. So we're going to start first um, with Stephen Birchfield, who is the field operations supervisor and food composting oper of food composting operations at Maryland Environmental Services. Stephen, thank you for joining us. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Just get my share screen set up here real quickly. All right, everybody got it? Yep. All right. Go away. Yep. Hold on, I'm trying to get the thing to share. Yeah, we can see it. There we go. There you go. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, so what is compost? Uh, by definition, it's the manufacturers through control of anaerobic, biological, and decomposition of uh, biodegradable materials. Um, the full U.S. compost and compost definition is there. Uh, but it really is what it means to us. It's closing the loop. So we look at compost and its feedstocks as a renewable resource. It's something that can be collected through residents, through businesses, through, uh, uh, through various haulers or, or the uh, residents themselves, brought to a facility like ours and then turned over, composted or recycled, however you want to look at it, and turn into this renewable resource that you can put back into the earth to grow more food and uh, to help sustain the soil. So why compost? Well, food scraps comprises of about 43% of all compostable materials, and that's almost 15% of all the generated waste, as we're seeing. Uh, next to uh, paper, it's uh, the largest one out there. Um, at the end, finished high-quality compost is added to the soil, and also, uh, you know, not only does it uh, add nutrients to deplete the soil, but it also adds fertility and keeps the uh, um, good things growing. So a little facility history here at the Prince George's County Yard Waste Facility, as it used to be called. Uh, we started here in 1990. Maryland Environmental Services uh, operated the facility for Prince George's County since the beginning, making the products uh, leaf grow. So traditionally, we accepted yard trim only, your grass, your leaves, brush, uh, what have you, and uh, we processed this through our uh, grinders uh, and open windrows, uh, eight month process, uh, finally screening the material out and selling the product as leaf grow. So the facility now is, we're now we're utilizing, we still have the windrow system. Uh, it's a lot smaller than it used to be, but we're not utilizing a core cover technology. We can now process up to 32,500 tons of food scraps per year. Uh, food scraps are collected by private and uh, contractors, uh, both in Prince George's, Charles, Baltimore, Montgomery County, District of Columbia, and uh, both in and out of the state of Maryland. Uh, compostable films are also part of the process. So we do accept the uh, compostable uh, products that you will see um, as far as like the uh, uh, the accepted ones we have on our list. And if anybody's interested in those, they can surely shoot, shoot me an email and I will provide them with the list of all of our acceptable films we accept here. So how the process works? Uh, well, they say you can't speed up composting, or can you? Uh, yard trim process is the, the, the longer of our two processes, taking about eight to nine months from start to finish. Uh, with food scraps trimmings, we only turn, we turn that process into 10 weeks. So from start to finish of this food scraps process, it's uh, you, know, you grind you grind everything up. You put it into our, our uh, composting um, bunkers or under the under the gore covers, and you know within eight weeks it comes out of the system. It goes through a maturing phase where the compost is just tested and checked to make sure it's uh, of high quality before it's sent out to the market. So what can be compostable? Uh, compostables do not always mean biodegradables, and they're not uh, sort of one and the same. Um, compostable products do break down and become part of the soil. Biodegradables, I believe, were originally designed to uh, save landfill space. So they break down in smaller little pieces, but don't actually ever become integrated as part of the soil. Um, again, we provide what we accept here at this facility, and it's a buyer beware market. Not all products are created the same. Um, stopping the contamination. Contamination is one of our biggest problems as a composter. 
uh, whether it's, uh, you know, plastics, it's uh, films, um, you know, recyclable products. We get a lot of recycling products that are mixed in and commingled. You know, you get the, the funny questions. Well, you know, it had food scraps on it, so it must be food waste. And, uh, you know, it's not food waste. It, it should be cleaned and recycled, and then your organics should come here for processing. Um, you know, the pictures you kind of see there was, it's, it's not really a joke, but it kind of makes me laugh every time I look at it. Is I don't, I don't know anybody in their right mind who would buy a single banana in a, uh, a foam container with a, you know, wrapped in cellophane or a, a potato wrapped in cellophane. You know, it, there's better ways to, to buy. And, you know, buying less food, you waste less food, think renewable instead of landfilling, and buying products that are in compostable packages are all better options. Uh, zero waste goals we have. Um, we're still looking to continue to be number one in the Maryland for waste diversion for Prince George's County at this facility. We did have a bag, uh, plastic bag ban in 2014, it banned the use of the uh, uh, non compostable bags for yard trim. Again, we do accept the compostable films on the food scrap side, so all of those uh, uh, type of products are accepted um, as long as they're on our list. And uh, the facility also has now reduced its own waste by reusing its uh, screened overs back in the process, where before, when we just had a yard trim, it uh, went out the door and uh, went to the landfill. So if you need to know more, here's my contact information. Uh, let me Thank know you. If you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of great information and a, um, a good place to start for this panel. Now I'm going to turn it over um, to Andrade, the Sustainability Coordinator from Baltimore City. Thank you so much, Chairman Barbe and members of the working group. I'm really happy to be here to talk about a little bit about what Baltimore City is doing. Um, the Baltimore Office of Sustainability works from a framework of the circle. <laughs> And uh, now more than ever, this is important because we're looking at the end of life of our city landfill and currently projected at 2026. And as many of you know, the incinerator where we bring most of our residential uh, waste is in the courts and in the hands of the lawyers. And we don't know what's gonna happen with that. So we really need to be looking more uh, at how we can take apart our waste stream and reuse things. We started doing this in 2014 when the Office of Sustainability put out the uh, waste to wealth strategy. And that is a three pronged approach to looking at how we could uh, recycle a lot of city uh, waste that was in, within our reach. The first aspect was uh, deconstruction, try to get C and D out of the waste stream. And we partnered with our housing department uh, failed twice on creating a program, but the third time we, uh, HCD created a long-term contract with Humanum to do deconstruction of our houses instead of demolition. And that became a $4 million, very successful pro uh, project. The second aspect is our city downed wood, the trees that come down from the city, which we bring to a location called Camp Small. And for 30 years, that wood was piling up and just rotting and you know, it was a hazard. And we tried many different ways to move that and um, recycle that wood. And in 2016, our office partnered with the Rec and Parks Forestry Division and we got a $98,000 loan, innovation loan from our finance department, which we used to hire somebody full time to look at uh, how to reuse the wood. And now that's become a national model for municipal reuse of wood. The third aspect of the program is food waste. And um, we partnered in 2016-17 with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance to create a food waste and recovery strategy. And we brought in about 75 uh, residents and stakeholders, a multiple of you are on this call right now. And we produced that the food waste and recovery strategy released by the mayor in 2018 with ambitious goals in, in number of different, four different areas. And as a result of putting that together that strategy, we were chosen by the Natural Resources Defense Council as one of two cities in the US to do what they call a deep dive on food waste. And that came along with about a half a million dollars in funding from the Rockefeller Foundation. And the first thing we did with that was hire a full-time staff person to work on this, because that's the beauty of having a little extra money in your pocket. You can hire somebody uh, to do some extra work. And so we began looking at waste in all areas. A lot of our work is not simply government. We do work for, with everybody around the city. Uh, so what the, the next thing we did is we formed a six city agency partnership. So breaking down the silos in city government. 
And DPW is our big main partner, of course, is along with along with the school system, food and nutrition folks getting uh, food waste out of the cafeterias. Uh, Baltimore Development Corps was our, is our contact at the grocery stores. We're working with the health department health inspectors. We created a brochure for them around food waste. They were thrilled to talk to us about food waste. They see it all the time and they just, it drives them crazy. And they go out to 5,000 uh, food facilities each year. And so we, we got a brochure together. We worked with them and they have something to talk to people about. Um, and we also partner with our Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts who, uh, when we went to them to ask if we could put up a, a stand to collect residential food scraps at the downtown JFX farmer's market, they opened us with welcome arms. And then we extended, expanded the program to the Waverly Farmer's Market. In addition, we used some of the funding to, to we gave out $200,000 worth of grants to people, organizations in the city who are already working on food race, waste and food rescue. And we have built out composting facilities in urban gardens throughout the city and trained people and we're continuing to do that and the hope that the urban, ag the urban farms will use it, but then the surrounding residents can come and drop off their residential food scraps there as well. We hired a consultant to cite uh, the, look at the economics of citing a mid-sized composting facility in the city. And we presented that last year to uh, the DPW leadership and our finance uh, director, as well as I know Brooke was at one of those meetings. That's my five minutes. But an important piece of this is legislation. So I really, you know, we need the legislation to help us move this forward faster. So thank you so much for listening to all of us and, and supporting our work. We'll see how we can support you. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for all your work doing. A, there's a lot of great stuff happening in many counties and in the city around Baltimore. So um, now we're gonna hear from Chaz Miller from Miller Recycling Associates. They, he is a member of the Maryland Recycling Network Board of Directors. Chaz. Oh, you're on mute. A lot of people like to keep me muted. Oh, somehow you went back on mute. Sorry about that. Chaz, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. Okay. Am I there you go. Now? There you go. Let's go Good for stuff. it. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the power of composting and organics recovery in Maryland. I am Chaz Miller. I have been involved in recycling and organics recovery since I was hired by the US EPA in 1976 to join its nascent recycling program. I am here to speak specifically about the findings of Montgomery County's Aiming for Zero Waste Task Force in regard to the importance of organics recovery and reducing the amount of materials going to disposal. The task force was a seven person group appointed by then County Executive Isaiah Leggett to advise the county as it developed its new solid waste plan. I chaired the task force. We made our final recommendations in April of this year they can be found on our webpage, and I've included a link to that on my testimony, along with attaching a copy of the recommendation. As part of the planning process, the county's consultant benchmarked Montgomery County's program against five of the most progressive programs in North America, King County in Washington State, Austin, Minneapolis, San Francisco, and Toronto. Montgomery County currently has a 42% recycling rate, excluding waste to energy ash recycling. We discovered that even the most aggressive recycling programs in North America struggle to reach a 50% recovery rate. Only King County exceeded 50%. Along with its largest city, Seattle, it has fallen short of achieving its 60% goals. Yet all five of these programs are focusing on curbside and commercial organics collection to increase diversion from disposal. While Montgomery County has an outstanding yard waste collection and composting program, it does not collect food waste at the curbside or require it from businesses. This is why the county lagged behind the five benchmarked programs. One of our key recommendations to require residential and commercial organics collection and diversion while ensuring a processing infrastructure is being developed. We specifically endorsed funding the purchase of two collection trucks for commercial and residential food recovery pilot programs. 
And I'm happy to say that those two trucks were included in the budget accepted by the county in June. As an experienced recycler, I wish to stress that recycling is not rocket science. I wish it was. Unfortunately, it is people science. Truly successful recycling programs create a social norm so that people will recycle wherever they are. We do well in single family housing, but we do poorly in multifamily housing, public spaces, and smaller businesses. Food waste collection and processing has its own unique challenges. Getting people to put aside their food waste and store it for a week is not as easy as getting people to put out their trash or their recyclables on the curbside. Food waste can be smelly and attract uh, pests. But if the experience of my family is any, any indicator, these challenges can be overcome. Along with many of our neighbors, we have been customers of Veterans Compost for over a year and are very happy with their performance. And the compost crew also is successfully collecting in our neighborhood. Successful organics recovery and processing requires a strong state regulatory structure. MES has done a good job in establishing those regulations. It also requires a strong processing infrastructure. Montgomery County will send its pilot program food waste to the Prince George's County Processing a Composting Facility. The county will need to develop its own infrastructure when it establishes its countywide programs. Siting these facilities is always a challenge. We can expect objections over traffic, uh, noise, odors, and other issues. The county must ensure that these challenges are met. The state of California has set aggressive organics recovery goals. It is also faced with a tremendous shortfall in composting and anaerobic digesting facilities. In spite of great efforts, that state is falling behind in meeting its goals to establish a processing structure and a viable end market. And we have a lot to learn from their experience. Successful organics recovery also requires markets for its end products. MES has been very successful with its leaf grow, leaf grow product and we just need to add to that success with food waste uh, recovery products. As one final note, I am on the board of the Maryland Recycling Network. We supported HB 589 in the last session. We look forward to legislation in the upcoming session focused on expanding organics recovery and in markets. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I look be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Chaz. That was... Uh... Um, great information. Really appreciate it. I was in Seattle a couple of years ago and saw my friend putting her composting out on the curb and I was, my mind was blown. <laughs> oh, the possibilities. Um, so thank you. And we're going to have a few people later today uh, who have companies that do that compost collection. So they'll be building off of your remarks. Um, but now we're going to turn to Peter Ettinger, who's the Chief Development Officer for Bioenergy Devco. Peter, thanks for joining us. My great pleasure, and thank you all for allowing me to speak today. I really want to talk about the concept of organic recycling. You know, the anaerobic digestion is a great example. Organic recycling. Hey, Peter. Was a you, phrase Peter, coined by Delegate Cassidy about two years hey, ago, Peter, where he recognized that. Peter, your your um yeah your yes. your connection is yes. quite bad. Um, it's quite difficult to understand you. Is there a place that you could get that you have a little bit of a better connection, perhaps? How about let me go find another place in our. Okay. We'll jump to the next speaker and then we'll come back to you just because we want to make sure we can hear you. Um, great. Um, so the next speaker is Linda Norris Walt from the US Composting Council, um, who lives in Frederick uh, County. Thank you for joining us, Linda. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen quickly here. Uh, can you all see the green plant there? We can. Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much, Honorable Environment and Transportation Committee members for allowing me to come today. I'm here um, as a resident of Middletown, Maryland, actually, to give you a high level national view from the U.S. Composting Council on compost infrastructure. And because I live here in Maryland, I know that that is a critical issue. Um, so the Composting Council has been around since 1990. Um, our mission, as you can see, is focused on compost manufacturing and compost use. 
And we believe that this is the way to healthy soils, clean air and water, stable climate, and a sustainable society. The primary areas where we work are in advocacy, um, education and training, certification of both products and operators of facilities, and compost use and compost marketing. So nationally, we have 770 organizations in the council um, that represent companies and individuals, total of 1,200. In Maryland, we have 35 members that represent about 57 individuals. And nationally, uh, we produce, our members produce approximately 14 million cubic yards of compost valued at $369 million. Um, the, one of the programs we have, our seal of testing assurance testing uh, verification program has 320 products that produce 10 million cubic yards of compost among that in 37 states. So one of the things that we wanted to bring to the table today is work that we are doing nationally that will benefit Maryland and other states. Um, and one of the big program that we're doing is our target organics program. And we started that in 2018. And what we did is looked at a lot of projects we already had going and things that we weren't doing yet, formed a committee and the committee did some surveys of municipalities where we have been focusing our, um, our stressing our efforts because municipalities control the waste stream and that seems the likely place to close some of these infrastructure gaps um, or compost deserts. So some of the interesting things we found, as you see, is that 92% um, are looking for help in infrastructure of the municipalities we spoke to. We had a lot of comments about funding and about public-private partnership. Many small municipalities do not want to run compost facilities, and they're looking to partner with private sector. Um, we also found through our own experience, as well as what they told us, that if a lot of them do not operate under any sort of organics ban, in their state or in their locality, which we know is a way towards more composting. We did a second survey to try to determine what types of tools we should focus on to help these municipalities. So uh, again, case studies, um, best management practices, outreach and education. We responded to all the uh, things that they said they needed in order to try to create more composting in their region. So this will all be concentrated on a target organics hub that we're working on right now that will come out in 2021 in its first version. And there are four areas we're focusing on. Um, if you start in the upper right corner, the planning of compost facilities by both private sector and the public sector, how to bring them, how to make them financially viable. Um, going down to the bottom right, we are working on templates, whether they are, we're ready to go out to stakeholders with a model zoning template because many localities do not have appropriate zoning for compost facilities. We already have a state permitting model out there that actually Maryland and 10 other states have used to develop their permitting regulations. We wanna do templates for contracts and also uh, templates for compost um, labeling, compostable product labeling. Um, operations, we will have tools that will help uh, new facilities develop, determining the best feedstocks to take in, uh, how to work on compost sales, and lastly, a national campaign for outreach and education and marketing across the country. I wanted to briefly mention that we do have a chapter in Maryland that works with the District of Columbia as well, and they have been successful in much of the legislation that has passed in Maryland over the years. You can see a couple of our members there um, who will be on the call and have been on others of your calls, and Brenda Platt from ILSR, Ben Perry, Compost Crew, Adam Ortiz from Montgomery County. Um, but there have been has been legislation pace, passed on state highway using compost in their specs. Um, labeling, we are one of three states right now that have compostable labeling legislation. And then the HB 171 report that had many recommendations that I'm sure you're all aware of. And of course, the USCC uh, sponsor, supported the HB 589 along with our chapter, um, which uh, would have put in a phased organic span in Maryland. So right. we su support those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. I appreciate all your work. And now we're going to go back to Peter. Um, are you with us, Peter? Yes, I am with you. Great. Awesome. I, uh, I do apologize. I needed no, to that's fine. Uh, 
It happens. For that connection. No, we just put, moved into a new office at 50 State Circle, and we're still in the middle of uh, putting up our, our all of our technology. So I apologize to the committee, but thank you very much. I am not Susanna Vaughn, although Susanna uh, leads most of our legislative efforts here at Bioenergy DevCo. I am the chief development officer of a company that builds and operates uh, anaerobic digesters throughout the world. We uh, have a history of 220 uh, throughout. We're actually now currently building in Jessup, Maryland, where we call, in fact, Maryland our corporate uh, U.S. home. Uh, the topic I really would like to talk a little bit about is the concept of organic recycling. Organic recycling is a phrase that was brought uh, to this committee by Delegate Cassidy some two years ago, where he purported to, to tie together um, the concept of composting and uh, anaerobic digestion, that these two things don't exist independently. They, in fact, are very, very complementary. So the difference in NAD for those of you who don't really know how it operates, is think of a cow's stomach on an industrialized scale. We take in organic materials through a four, four chamber system. We manage that in a completely enclosed environment. So there are no odors, there are no, we, there are no uh, issues of, of our challenges of es uh, escaping gas. We manage that, we create renewable natural gas, and we also create an, a compost equivalent called digestic. In fact, the state of Maryland last year, in 2018 as well, recognized the organic qualities of, of uh, digestic being similar or uh, the same as compost itself. This kind of material is used throughout Europe, through, really used throughout the world as a way to create healthy soils and bring back carbon into the environment or into the soils at that point. We have a number of strategies, and I think this is very complementary to the focus that we have now in this state on waste diversion. The idea being that how do we be make better use of materials in a true example of the circular economy that typically would go to incineration or landfills. If we can utilize those organics in a positive way, we have the ability to really manage excess organics, creating a new and productive product that can be used through either by business or consumers. In fact, a typical facility that we'll have at Maryland Food Center Authority will reduce carbon emissions by the equivalent of 26,000 tons per year. And we operate for a 20 or 30 year period. So we're part of a local community. And in fact, we are very lucky that we've been in this business for quite a while. We have been financed successfully. So we put our money where our mouth is, where we go and identify where large sites and large organic um, opportunities are. We'll then go build and take this on as a growing, growing business. Uh, creating renewable natural gas, there really is only one source of really truly renewable natural gas. Our product comes from organics, not from any kind of fossil fuel. We use natural fermentation, the idea being that how do we use microbes that would start it out in this world a couple billion zillion years ago to create this product, and how do we do that in an organized and managed way? Now, we've been doing it for 20 plus years, so it really means we can ensure and guarantee performance of a plant. And ideally what we do then is we complement the process by working with composting facilities, either using or adapting digestate, being able to create, because the process that we go through kind of accelerates that, that process by 30 to 40 days. We then create a, a, a similar organic product that can be used as the basis of any new kind of soil, soil products or direct application. So I think that the thing that I would really want to say to the committee is that, that waste diversion is becoming a, a very important topic for us all to consider. We need to understand better ways to use materials that typically would go to incineration or typically go into greenhouse gas producing um, a, 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 a facilities or landfills, that we should recognize that there are diminished land here and that there are concerns in terms of environmental justice, in terms of managing these kinds of, of, of waste products or perceived waste products where, uh, and be able to look at those as an opportunity uh, to support the, not only the state, but the people, people within Maryland. So I thank you for the opportunity. We're happy to can't bring people for tours and uh, look forward to being a, a long time, and being a long time resident. I look forward to actually building a facility here on, or actually several. That's great. And you mentioned that you are building one in Jessup right now? Jessup, Maryland, yep. That's we great. are, uh, we are, the, we picked Jessup because we were at the center of a hundred and at the Maryland Food Center Authority, 
So we went in front of the Board of Public Works. We uh, did a 20, actually a 30 year lease at the facility and we're now, um, hopefully knock on wood, you should hear contractors running down the, down the hallway right now, digging, digging holes for us to start. We'll be in operation in June of 2021. Great, thank you. Interesting. Great pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and Sorry now we're going to. Yep. No, no, it's totally fine. Um, so now we're going to move over to. We're going to hear from four different small businesses um, in Maryland, uh, some larger than others, that are going to talk about their work in the composting and organics recycling space. Um, we're going to start with Justin Garrity from Veteran Compost, and then move to Marvin Hayes from the Baltimore Compost Collective Program. Ben Perry from Compost Crew, and final uh, and finish with Mark Hollick from Mundia. Uh, Justin, you want to take us away? Sure. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Let me uh, try sharing my screen here. I use less Zoom than probably most people in America as a compost guy. So, can everyone see my slide deck there? Yep. Okay. It worked. All right. So let's do this. I will win the award for shortest slide deck of the day. Uh, let me just start my timer to be polite. And um, real quick, uh, I'm Justin Garrity. I'm the founder and president of Veteran Compost. So we are a group of veterans that makes compost. Um, so I just have two slides. One's gonna cover a quick background on the company. Apologies to people who already know this stuff. And then I'll also just talk about the challenges we face and maybe some suggestions on ways the composting could happen here in the state of Maryland. So we started, or I started in July of 2010 with a shovel, not making up a story that's real. Um, started the business with the money in my pocket, a shovel and a bucket. We've now grown to two compost facilities, one in Aberdeen, Maryland, uh, one in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, we're working on a third site in Lothian that uh, as noted here is stuck in permitting. I'll talk about that in a second. But we've gone from the me show, the one person to 25 full-time employees. We pay a living wage. Uh, we receive zero government assistance on our two operating facilities. We have dental benefits, a 401k match. Um, we're always trying to grow more uh, in terms of headcount and in terms of benefits for our employees. Everyone's W-2 um, and uh, et cetera. So we compost um, roughly a million pounds of food waste per month at our two facilities. Uh, we both collect and compost. We're proud over the last 10 years, be the only company that does that here in Maryland that operates permitted compost facilities and collects material. Shout out to Chaz for mentioning me during his talk. Also Chaz, I love the new retirement hairdo. That is a good look, man. Um, but we produce from the food scraps we collect uh, a lot of different materials. So we produce compost, topsoil, worm castings, and uh, more and more different kinds of blends. So this year uh, we embrace science which I know is controversial in 2020 to believe in science, but we hired a soil scientist. And so she's working on our staff. We went through on our 10th anniversary and kind of looked at our QAQC and our internal um, procedures, how we could improve the product and then what we could do to continue to meet the needs of our customers, putting out new products this year, like super soil. Um, we're bringing out an organic seed starter for farmers and things like that. This is the nice slide. This is a slide that I don't get invited to environmental meetings because this is the things, this is the bad news in composting. Number one thing that's holding me back is unfair competition from municipalities and MES. Steven, I love Steven, he's a cool dude as a person, but MES crushes me um, because they don't price to the market. So they charge too little for tip fees and often give away compost. So if everyone thinks about where they live in the state of Maryland, many municipalities give their residents free compost or give it away at a very low price. So that that kind of handcuffs what I can charge and forces me to set my prices to deal with that. So one thing that we could do is make those municipalities do some market analysis. Maybe every two years they could have to hire a consultant and look at their pricing and make sure that it's fair. So if, if PG County sold gasoline for 50 cents a gallon, we wouldn't let them get away with that. But that's essentially what they're doing right now. And that makes it hard for me to charge 225 a gallon for my gasoline. Number two is lack of land to build compost facilities. Unfortunately, when it comes time for me to come to town, all the environmentalists run away. And so in Anne Arundel County, if you read the articles, I was left alone sitting at the table for the most part. Um, and many of the environmental groups actually turned on me and used uh, NIMBY uh, as a reason to try to get me out of town. So it, it's disappointing that we have trouble finding sites. Um, everyone loves us. Everyone loves veterans. Everyone loves composting. Um, they just don't want it in their neighborhood. 
Uh, also, local and state permits are a challenge. The last bullet, I know I'm going to run out of time. Since this is the Transportation Committee, Maryland has very aggressive DOT policing. We're pulled over our drivers every one to two weeks. Yesterday, one of our drivers was pursued for over 20 miles, eventually pulled over, passed the inspection, but the officer told him, we'll get you next time, we'll be watching. So uh, it makes me now want to buy more trucks and get them on the road in Maryland. Um, and finally, the Lothian project, which I mentioned in Arundel County. Um, I started this project five years ago. Since then, I've met a girl, got engaged, got married, moved three times, uh, had two kids who are now three and a year and a half old, and we are still not operational in Lothian, Maryland. So it's very difficult to move forward in this industry because of local uh, and state permitting issues. So any help that we could get on those three issues, I think would lead to explosive growth in our industry because it would get rid of the barriers that are holding others back in our company as well. And finally, I'll just say that um, a food waste ban would not would negatively affect um, our business. I'm happy to talk about that during questions because I know I'm at my time. Great. Thank you, Justin, for being so candid and for providing a lot of really useful and helpful information. Marvin, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I must make a disclaimer before I get started. Uh, you will not be safe uh, with your PPEs, washing your hands, us being virtual. It is my intentions to give you compost fever. Uh, my name is Marvin Hayes and I'm the youth program manager for the Baltimore Compost Collective. We serve the Federal Hill community and we operate out the amazing Filbert Street Garden, which I like to call the Wakanda of South Baltimore where we don't make vibranium, but we do make leaf gold, black gold compost for residents who don't have access to green space. We provide the compost soil enhancer, black gold for those residents to be able to grow healthy food and healthy vegetables. When you add compost to the soil, it sequesters carbon and put carbon back into the soil. With healthy soil, you have healthy vegetables. We train youth in small scale composting from Curtis Bay, all of my youth composters come from Ben Franklin High School, and we collect food scraps from Federal Hill, Riverside, Curtis Bay, Brooklyn, and Locust Point. We bring it back to the Filbert Street Garden, and we process it and make it into black gold. Why is this so important to Filbert Street Garden? We're in one of the most toxic areas in Baltimore City. We are, uh, we have two, two uh, excuse me, we have a landfill, two incinerators, uh, coal plant, kerosene company, chemical company. We have the highest asthma rate in Baltimore City. Uh, when you burn trash, you create a chemical called carbon dioxide. When you bury trash, you create methane gas. 80% uh, of Baltimore City municipal trash can be composted, recycled, or reused. So it is 2020 and we should not be incinerating, trap, burning food scraps. Uh, we can turn food scraps into black gold to be able to use to grow healthy food and healthy vegetables. Uh, we are asking, uh, our wish list at the Baltimore Compost Collective is for mandatory recycling for Baltimore City, curbside compost pickup. We are the little caboose that's gonna put, push Baltimore City towards zero waste. We are showing that you can collect. I started out five years ago with five customers and we went around to Federal Hill and knocked on the door, me and my youth composters and told people about the benefits of composting. Now we are at 77 customers. We're getting ready to launch uh, with the Office of State Sustainability uh, and Baltimore City Public Schools, uh, contactless drop off site at Patterson Park, Mount Washington, we have went contactless because of COVID-19, uh, so we have a contactless drop-off where our customers come and drop their compost off, and we uh, process what we can at the Filbert Street Garden, and then we haul to Western Branch. Big shout out to Steve. Uh, we are hoping for a large-scale compost facility here in Baltimore City. Uh, we also we also are asking that everyone in Baltimore City create three bins in your house. One for your waste, one for your compost. As Ms. Andretti said, we have free compost drop off. If you cannot afford to get a collection service like myself, compost crew, compost cab, veteran compost, waste neutral, you can drop your compost off at the two farmers market uh, at Waverly and under Jones Falls Expressway. So we wanna encourage 
people to compost. We are the model for composting for Baltimore City, along with the Institute for Local South Reliance. We have launched compost composting uh, bins at Plantation Farm, uh, Strength to Love, uh, Hidden Harvest, a uh, number of community gardens throughout the Farm Alliance. So uh, I will end with my slogan and what I always preach for Baltimore, we're gonna compost, learn so you don't have to burn. We're gonna starve the incinerator. We're gonna feed the soil and feed the community. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Thank you for all your work. Um, and for those committee members who don't know that Filbert Street Garden is in District 46, which I'm proud to represent. Um, and Marvin and all the folks at the Filbert Street Garden are really miracle workers and doing uh, incredible work, bringing great food to the community. Um, so thank you, Marvin. Now I'm going to turn it over to Ben Perry, the CEO of Compost Crew. All right. Can you see my screen and hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, this is a great idea, these work groups. My name is Ben, CEO of Compost Crew. And I'm definitely in a tough spot. Not only am I the 15th speaker, but I'm following Marvin and Justin. So if you remember nothing else, please remember to watch this documentary, Kiss the Ground. It does an excellent job of explaining how we are damaging the earth's soil through unsustainable agricultural practices. And it also explains how we can do better. Composting is certainly not the only solution, but it's definitely an important part of the solution. And it's the form of organics recycling that we have decided to focus on as a business. I'll, in my presentation, I'll, I'll start with a quick introduction of our company, and then I'll cover a topic related to organics recycling policy. So Compost Crew is a locally owned business based in Rockville, Maryland. We provide simple, convenient, and affordable composting services for thousands of customers in the greater Washington, D.C. region and in the Baltimore region as well. We offer collection services for single family homes, for multi-unit apartment buildings, and for basically any type of business or organization. And we also do have a, a small on-farm compost facility as well. We're an equal opportunity employer, and our team includes a, a really good mix of people with diverse experience. And one area that we've been focusing on recently is helping municipalities roll out food scrap curbside collection programs and drop-off programs as well. And we've compiled many of these lessons learned into a white paper, which you can access at compostcrew.com slash localgov. The programs that we've been implementing for municipalities range from full subsidy curbside collection programs, which have the highest participation, but are also higher cost to the municipality. And then, you know, compared to, for example, drop-off programs, which are much lower cost for the municipality, but also have lower participation. On the, the right side, you will also see community organized programs, which have been very popular. And in this case, the municipality isn't paying anything. The residents are organizing themselves um, to sign up for collection services. And in exchange, we give them steep discounts. So you can find more takeaways and case studies in the white paper. So there's no doubt that composting services work and a good number of people and businesses are willing to pay for the services, even without incentives and regulations. And that number is growing. However, government definitely has an important role to play if we want to accelerate the adoption of organics recycling. And one of the things I've noticed is that when we talk about organics recycling and composting, a lot of people have a tendency to first think or only think about diversion rates, methane emissions, and climate change, which are absolutely important. But soil, soil health becomes an afterthought a lot of times, and, and it shouldn't be. Composting absolutely helps with mitigate climate change. But when we think about food scrap recycling, we need to remember that we are rescuing an organic resource from the landfill or from the incinerator and repurposing that organic resource into the 
building blocks of life on earth. Composting together with other regenerative farming techniques is necessary to maintain the ability to grow food without permanently destroying the soil's ability to support, to support crops, to support livestock and to support wildlife. And the beauty of composting as a form of recycling, especially when compared to things like plastic recycling, is that the food waste, the end product, the finished compost, and the jobs can all be kept in a very tight circle. So I get a weekly share of produce from a local CSA that also composts food scraps. So my food waste is supporting a farm that's 30 minutes down the road. And the even better news is that we don't need expensive technology or massive industrial plants to make this happen. We just need to do more of it faster. And fortunately, Maryland is supported by a vibrant set of composting businesses and organizations like veterans, like compost crew and others who have been doing good work for a while now in the state. Okay. And as we grow our business with governments, we can invest more into the sector and we can continue to grow our employment. And because we can keep those food scraps and nutrients within a tight area, the investment and the jobs are also created in that same local area. Great. So Thank bottom you. line is that this is an exciting time to be part of, of the industry as we push to make food scrap recycling a habit of the mass market. And I'm very grateful for your attention to this matter and would be Thanks. happy to continue collaborating. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for joining us. Um, and now we're going to end up this panel with Mark Hollick from Mundia. I think he's muted. Yeah, we can't we can't hear you, Mark. Okay. How about now? Yeah. We can hear you now and see your screen. All right. Great. So my name is Mark Hollick from Mundea Group. Uh, we started last year in Baltimore to help uh, businesses save money on waste management and reduce their environmental footprint. Uh, we started with a couple of local restaurants and bakeries. Um, in terms of a process, we first analyze the business current situation, which means that we look at the number of bins that they have, how many times it's picked up per week, along with the current cost level. Next, we set up waste diversion programs such as recycling and composting. And if applicable, we also connect them to the Maryland Food Bank. Now for this testimony, I would like to highlight three main things that we've learned over the last year. First, if you look at the EPA's food recovery chart, we are mostly focusing on composting and feed hungry people. However, the good news is that once businesses improve the internal process, it also leads to source reduction, which is the most preferred way of food recovery. Secondly, from a policy perspective, most targets are based around how much trash can be diverted from the landfill. In terms of volume, which is how customers tend to look at it, more than 80% waste reduction can be achieved by simply setting up a recycling and composting program. Third, from an industry perspective, which is how they, which is where they track uh, waste in terms of weight, a reduction of more than 85% can be achieved after implementation of both programs. Now for this year, we're trying to expand into more neighborhoods in Baltimore. And for next year, we're preparing to launch in DC and Philadelphia, as well as investing in the general infrastructure. We appreciate the opportunity to provide input to the work group. And if you have any questions, please feel free, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Great, thank you for joining us today, Mark, and thanks for all your work. Um, so now we have, I'm gonna turn it over to delegates who have a few questions. Um, we're gonna start with Delegate Holmes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is for Mr. Birchfield, and uh, Mr. Birchfield, I uh, want to thank you for your service to gorgeous Prince George's. Um, and, and, and very shortly, I'm hoping that you can find a way to get Adam Ortiz back to Prince George's County and steal him from Montgomery County. But anyway. Forget about it. 
You can't um, have him. <laughs> uh, Mr. Birchfield, I've had the, uh, the opportunity in a previous profession to have designed a couple of landfills. So I know that there are a lot of requirements for linings and cover and all of those kinds of things. Uh, but I've never really had the opportunity to investigate uh, leachate and the testing of leachate after the uh, landfills have been uh, constructed and, and have been in operation for a while. What kind of testing, and, and I know that the landfill in Prince George's County doesn't necessarily have any major concerns about water tables because there is no well and septics in the area. But what kind of testing do you do for uh, you know, saturation into the soil as the landfill is uh, operating? So our facility is uh, actually not at the landfill. Uh, we're a separate location about uh, 15 miles away from the Prince George's County landfill. And our entire 52 acre site is blacktop and paved. Um, so any contact water uh, that's, you know, as far as runoff goes to a collection pond where we do sampling uh, once a month, we're required to sample it once every quarter. Um, but we do do that sampling once a month uh, just to keep up on things. Uh, as far as the leachate, like for the gore system where we do all the food scraps, um, the collection process happens in, in each individual bunker and then it's piped to a collection tank where it's either reused back into the composting process because there's still a lot of nutrients and a lot of biology in that liquid that's beneficial to composting. So if it's not getting reused, we actually take it next door to uh, WCC as our next door neighbor and uh, they help process it for us. Um, but as far as testing the, the waters and things, we do all that uh, in-house um, for our outfalls at our pond. But uh, how, how have, often is that testing done? So we test once a month. Our outfalls are tested once a month, and uh, but we're required uh, by our, our, our permits for Tremor for uh, once every quarter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sorry I had to unmute there. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Delegate Boyce for a question. Thank you so much, uh, Delegate Lerman. I, I have so many questions right now um, as it relates to composting. And I, I'll start with, um, I think, the question that everyone can lend to and then kind of work down. But I think the first is essentially, if, if this is so easy, why aren't we doing more of this? Or why aren't we just doing this? I personally composted myself for about uh, maybe eight years and then it just got too much for me. And then now I have a service. And so if this is so easy and if it's so easy to just divert according to the, the individuals who are doing this, why aren't we collectively, whether it's the state or the municipality, why aren't we just doing this? And, and I think that leads into the second question of, um, I think, uh, AKA Susanna Vaughn, <laughs> Peter, um, start, talked about uh, your, your ability to have a, a good amount of startup money to be able to do this and really wanna talk about from the group, how much does it really cost startup from you know, basic to um, uh, uh, to um, um, big, I guess, corporate size landfills or whatever to to really start and just get this going um, all over. And then I would I wanted to go back to um, Stephen to say um, you seem like you have a pretty successful program in Prince George's County, um, and I'd be curious about the amount of land that is currently being actually used um, for the composting, how much more can you use? And um, considering we're more than likely moving to do this, not only within each municipality, but for the state, um, how much more land or how much more composting um, can you take on the current land and how much more land would you potentially need? Because I guess what I'm hearing in general is that um, land is hearing one person saying we have the technology to do it all indoors so there's not the issue of of smell or so on and so forth and then other people you're saying you're outside so I guess the, the the question is is does Maryland really have the capacity whether it's indoor or outdoor if tomorrow we decided that everybody's doing this um the capacity to actually do this um 
And then the last question is for um, Mr. Uh, I think it's Je Justin. Um, I do want you to touch more on your this uh, kind of food waste ban negatively affecting your business. I remember you from committee and you've mentioned some other things about other composting organizations that negatively affect you. And I'd like you to be able to touch on that when you have the opportunity. So anybody can start. Could, could I start? I'll, I'll start with a quick answer to the first question about the easy. Um, you know, I have a family of five and the easiest way to feed my three boys every evening would be to go through the drive through at McDonald's. Um, but, you know, that's not the best for them. So we don't always take the easy route because it's, you know, it takes a little bit more effort to, to do the healthier thing. You know, one thing that is so important is just, you know, Chaz talked about it, the fun, this is a people problem. And our education system, our, the awareness of the importance is just not there. So for example, I have neighbors in my neighborhood who they will cart away a lot of their grass clippings and a lot of their leaves, taking all of that organic material and those nutrients away from their property and putting more burden onto the recycling system. But then they use chemical fertilizers to replace those nutrients that they're carting away. So that's just a basic educational and awareness issue that we really need help from governments to, to help overcome. So it's just not composting, whether it's food scrap recycling or yard waste, it's just not a habit. We just don't know about the importance. All of, all of the folks you hear, we're still in, a, in somewhat of a bubble and we need support to help um, spread the awareness. It, I can add to that uh, about land and, and costs. And I want to second Marvin's thought that I have not only the compost fever, the digestate fever, but I have the recycling fever. And we are, we are all in to making sure that the state of Maryland can embrace the integration of these very important renewable technologies and, and services and end all products. What we do when we first go in to a location is we primarily, we focus on accessibility is of feedstocks. So we do our own um, uh, data. We have a business intelligence group who goes in and says, okay, if I had a location, where should we locate? Where should we be? And typically we focus on large corporations. So if you think of Jessup, Maryland, it's the center of all food products uh, being distributed really along the mid-Atlantic. There are 106 different companies that range from Dole, the coastal Sunbelt, in almost 800,000 tons of material that come out, out of that facility that either go to landfill or are taken three or four hours away to a, farm, to a farm, adding to transportation costs and others. Uh, our typical uh, land mass is roughly five acres. Uh, we can do it smaller, we can do it larger. Our Delmarva facilities on, is on 220 acres, but it has a 30 uh, acre compost facility that it focuses primarily on poultry waste, DAF waste, other materials that should not be land applied and that have great odors. Uh, our investment in, is typically in the $25 million range uh, on, in these types of projects. They range from 20 to 30, call it. We employ anywhere from between 15 to 30 people. Um, and our secondary goal around that is, is then, because we're in a location for 30 years, typically, we have a, a community uh, community relationship program where we're actually trying to go into schools and working with county supervisors and others and saying, look, you know, let's get more organized. If you're paying, a, if you're putting a check down to a, a local school, we should be enforcing uh, composting and organic recycling. So we try to work within those communities to broaden uh, from the call it the corporate base into the into the home as well. Yes, I just I'm sorry. I apologize, please. You can go first. I'll go after. Oh, I'm sorry, Marvin. Yes. Uh, so this is Linda. I just wanted to jump in with a quick national perspective because several of the speakers actually gave answers to um, the beginning of Delegate Voice's question. Um, the zoning is nationally, I mentioned, we have found that that is one of the biggest impediments is having to rezone. And then you step into that place where public perception and NIMBYs um, come in and, and kill a lot of facilities around the country. Um, the other thing that we're finding is, you know, you make a profit from composting on the way in by charging a tipping fee. And if you're doing a good job, you 
as was referenced in terms of public um, pricing for compost um, sale versus private pricing, if you do a god good job on the way out, you have a viable business and there has to be a good balance on those. Um, and then money for equipment. A lot of, we have tons of startup facilities, startup entrepreneurs in the council, but they have the knowledge, they have the training, but they don't have the money to make the investment. Yes, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the education. Uh, the only way that we're gonna get to zero waste is through Education Avenue. Uh, we have to educate. Uh, I'm an OSI fellow and part of my uh, fellowship is to educate the affected youth of Baltimore City and small scale composting with uh, uh, emphasis on anti-incineration. I am working with an amazing group, I like to call the Environmental Justice League, where we're gonna be taking the leaders of Baltimore City on a zero waste boot camp and show them other cities that have went from incineration to zero waste practices. Uh, when you know better, you do better. Five years ago, I, I was exposed and taught uh, composting. Now I have a worm bin in my house where I am composting all of my uh, vegetables. So we can get there through education. Education is the key and to way to zero waste. Thank you. Yeah, I, this is Steve here. I'd like to back up more what you just said. Education really is the key to all of this. And it, it's, uh, I would say two of the big factors is image and education. And it's image because uh, for a long time, composting was this stinky, ugly thing that farmers did to make things disappear. And really, truthfully, uh, composting is, uh, you know, for us here, it's a way of life. And a lot of my fellow composters, Justin, Marvin, and so, um, you know, this, this is what's making, making the soil healthy. It's what's making things grow. And it's, it's, uh, it's recycling something that typically people don't think that you can recycle. Um, and to touch back on the original part of the question is on land. Uh, so we are blessed with, uh, I said 52 acres for the blacktop here, but the entire facility for us is 220 acres. So we have lots of room for expansion. The county set aside this land uh, in 1991. I believe they purchased it from uh, WCC or the state. I had to ask Prince George's County for the exact answer on that. That was long before my time here. Um, but we are blessed to have a, a, a wonderful location, uh, plenty of space to, to, you know, open up our arms and stretch our legs if we wanted to do so. And, uh, you know, collect more compost and process more. Uh, when we went to the Gore system to process food scraps, it was a two-fold system. One, we could accept a different or a new, uh, um, you know, source of, of compost for uh, collections. And also it was able for us to reduce uh, the amount of space needed to, uh, to facilitate that compost. Um, when we were just in a winter operation, we had maybe 55 to 60 long wind rows, 300 yards long, approximately each row. Uh, and now we are a third of that. And then the middle part of our facility is now where all of our feedstock material comes to. And then the other third is where all of the, uh, the gore system and the food scraps is processed. So we're actually, you know, we're growing in our same spot. We're collecting, you know, more material in without having to touch the other acreage that we're, uh, you know, is currently available to us. And the idea was that we would be able to reduce our food, our, our footprint um, and then work with the county. Eventually, I believe in their 10-year uh, solid waste plan, they wanted to look into doing a resource recovery facility. Uh, again, questions on that should be directed towards the county, but uh, we're happy to be down here. And delegate voice, I could just talk about Baltimore for a minute. Just, you know, you know how hard it is to get people to recycle properly in Baltimore, right? And we have a low recycling rate. So, and we have to, in order to have a high recycling rate, you have to continually educate. We, when we did the switch over to single stream, we did a lot of education, we had higher rates, but you have to continue to, to do that with any kind of behavior change shift. So that's a big piece of it. Um, we have some nice educational materials, by the way, that we just really Baltimore centric that we've just finished. And I can send those out to um, Delegate Lehrman to share with others as well. Um, uh, you know, as for us, I think looking at, um, we can't, obviously in Baltimore, we can't do anything wonderful and beautiful like they do in Prince George's because we don't have the land for that. I'm thinking that what, and we even looked at citing a mid-sized facility here, but that may even be too big to put on some of our landfills. So, I mean, a one way that Baltimore could move forward is citing much smaller facilities. I and mean, Justin's facility in Aberdeen is three acres, right? So, 
this idea that the city could offer a piece of small piece of property in a properly zoned area uh, to a private partner to operate there is something that we're talking about with DPW at the moment. So, you know, there's, you have, there's so many ways to move it forward and you have to start with commercial. The residential is so tricky. Yeah, it is. All right, I'll hop in last then. Thanks, Ann, for the good segue. So our facility in Aberdeen is about three acres and we employ uh, 12 people at that facility and we do about 20 tons a day of food waste. So um, it's not huge, but it's like a measurable amount of material and it's a good employer. Um, if we have, so we don't need a big property to get started. The actual equipment, like I think um, had been mentioned by Linda, the startup equipment, you're probably looking, if you went cheap and I'm a cheap guy, you can probably do it for about a hundred to $200,000. The kicker is the permitting. So in the last couple of years, we've spent, I don't know, $200,000 on that Anne Arundel County project. It's either going to open or bankrupt our company. We'll see what happens first to if we can survive Anne Arundel County planning and zoning. Um, so that's the biggest startup cost. Like I know Key Compost in Frederick County, he's trying to get started. And it's just very onerous to get started. So when I started in 2010, it was an eight page Word document I wrote myself to MDE the money in my pocket and a shovel and I was open. And now you can't, you can't do that now. It's not possible that door closed. And so if you were an entrepreneur that wanted to get into this industry, it's very intimidating. So I think there's probably some opportunities to find ways to excite people about composting as was mentioned and then give them a pathway to being able to establish a business. Um, the other point that I mentioned about the food waste ban, it, you know, I, that's why I'm not welcome at a lot of, compost events. But when I look at other states with food waste bans in the Northeast, Rhode Island has a food waste ban open to digester, nobody like me. Connecticut, digester, nobody like me. Massachusetts, digesters, large facilities. So these bans, they do bring in sometimes capacity, but they bring in large out-of-state organizations. They don't bring entrepreneurs to the party. Um, the other problem is, um, you know, we're going to see a lot of haulers that will pick people's stuff up. And I've testified in the past I believe to this committee about people pick stuff up all over Maryland every day for compost and it does not go to compost facilities. So there is not a good mechanism and, and commercial and residential customers view collection as a commodity. So there's really no difference in a consumer's mind between my service and another. And so, you know, when the larger operators or other operators get into collection during a food waste ban, is there a mechanism to make sure that that material actually goes to an appropriate facility? And then the last thing is it'll, I think, only cause more government um, involvement in our industry in terms of the county seeing this as something to put on their shoulders to meet their solid waste mandates. And so we'll see more county facilities, county and municipal government collection programs, and that'll be difficult for us to compete against. So those are the reasons that I, I think a food waste ban is difficult unless there was maybe some, some thought put into it to maybe some protections for custom, you know, com companies like ours. Thanks, Justin. Can, just, I, can I just wanna... respond to that for a minute? Because Sorry. I do think this is a room for entrepreneurship. The challenge with anaerobic digestion, whether it's small or large, and we've done these in two acres in the middle of major cities around the world, is what to do with digesting and how to manage digesting, how to make sure that it's an applicable product that's integrated with compost so that it becomes a business. So I do think there's an opportunity to make these two things. It's why we call it organic recycling. So I don't, you know, you guys have a, an interesting challenge of social and re, social policy, and also then how do we provide incentives for businesses to succeed if they're needed? You know, how do we achieve both in a concurrent time? So I just, I, I think it's important to know that it's not one or the other, it should be both and it should be managed effectively. It just feels like we only have everyone, so I just want to finish with that. Sorry. Sorry, are you, are you much, Brooke, how much time do we have? We have about 20 minutes left and we have two more delegates with questions, Delegate Lehman and then Chairman Barbe. So for the next answer, we just have to keep it a little bit shorter. <laughs> so Delegate Lehman. Thank you, can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Delegate Learman, for your, your leadership um, and in this uh, group. This is the second uh, meeting I've attended and they have both been excellent. 
Um, my questions, a couple of questions for um, Mr. Birchfield. So thank you for your, your presentation on the Prince George's County Composting Program. I'm a former county council member and um, you know really, really appreciate what I've heard over the years about this facility. I, I did a site visit back when it was, it's right beside the, um, at Western Branch or near Western Branch beside the uh, yard waste facility, correct? It's right in the same, same location? So, so yeah, the yard waste uh, facility is the same location. Where right, the, the right. And, and I do, I know um, my former council colleague and current ENT colleague, Delegate Harrison and many, many other gardeners, countless gardeners I know are huge fans of leaf grow. So thanks for the good work you're doing. Um, my question is about the issue you mentioned in your presentation, but you didn't sort of um, expand on, on the issue of contamination and how you define that. Because my understanding, I, I tried to help with the um, residential pilot program for curbside composting to get the word out in my community, for example, when the county was looking for, for more people to participate. And the one thing, you know, in looking over the materials and the containers um, that I received as part of a kit was that the old rules uh, for disposal, for example, uh, with food containers, um, like the, the, the classic example is a pizza box that has grease in it. You know, it used to be that you couldn't send things like that. You couldn't mix that in with, with food waste. And it seemed like the program was a lot more flexible about what the, the term I think of as contamination. So what exactly did you mean by contamination? It was a little startling, you know, to me to see that you would send a whole truckload back um, which I think was part of your one of your slides that that said you know if there was contamination it would all it would all be rejected. Um, so if you could just expand on all of that a little bit. Sure. So the contamination issue it's it's kind of multifaceted. Um, and to touch on the, the sending the whole truck back. The idea is to to change the behavior of of either the hauler on how they view the compost when they pick it up, or to change the generator's view on what they consider to be you know, organic waste. Um, and the idea is we were getting, you know, uh, you know, some material was coming in full of metal, uh, you know, glass light bulbs, uh, bottles, it, it, a lot of recycling uh, was mixed in with it. And, you know, for example, one, one person who was sent, it was, uh, you know, crushed up, uh, I guess, old deep fryers, they decided to do a kitchen rebuild at a restaurant and everything that had to do with food scraps went into the food scraps recycling bin and ended up at our site. And, uh, we have 13 employees uh, for five days a week, so trying to sort of separate everything ourselves at the time was uh, extremely difficult. So the idea was to try to change how people viewed both the compostable materials and what they had, um, what they were putting in their bins. And as far as what we consider contam contamination, again, it's you know glass, uh, you know regular plastics, um, non-compostable films, biodegradables, uh, again not compostables. We have specific lists we asked our haulers and generators to stick to because we know that those materials will break down in our process. Um, we've had it tested them ourselves. Uh, the ones that don't sort of make the cut, we try to contact the manufacturer and say, hey, look, we can't make this work. You know, what, what's the deal? And sometimes they tell us, well, it works great in our lab. Uh, well, we're in the real world. We don't have a lab out here. I'm trying to make it work, uh, you know, in the real world. And it doesn't work. Um, so that product, you know, wouldn't make our list. Uh, okay. but Victor, the quick follow up. Yes. Go ahead. Quick follow up. What percentage of of your material coming in do you have to reject? Uh, so it's very low at this time. Um, usually we get those rejected loads are when we pick up a new client or a new hauler, and it's sort of in the uh, the honeymoon phase of the relationship where they you know they don't quite understand maybe you know their. Uh, their, their used, uh, um, you know, their, their used kitchen gloves aren't compostable, but they had the food scraps on and I, I got, uh, you know, tomato waste all over my gloves. They should go in the compost bin, but no, they, should, they shouldn't. Um, and we invite folks down, COVID-19 has kind of put a hold on all of this, but we, we usually invite uh, clients, customers, generators, and haulers down for tours so we can answer these questions accordingly. We can say, hey, look, this is what our site does. This is what the technology does. This is what we're expecting from you guys. This is what will happen if we don't get something we expect. Uh, we want to work with the customers. We want to work with the generators and the haulers to get the, the material here and to keep it, you know, keep it clean. 
Um, we don't want to just reject the material and say, no, we don't want your business. We want your business and we want to make sure that you're doing the right thing and that that feel good still there, but you're feeling good because you are doing the right thing. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Delegate Learman, just one quick comment. It doesn't require a response, but um, to the, the uh, speaker who mentioned, um, you know, permitting and, and that it's become more onerous and, and it's expensive. You know, I don't, I don't know if there's anything, you know, any of us can do about, about the cost. I imagine that's tied to the review of the permit, but I will just say, you know, it's still, I think as much as we all love the, the idea of composting and want to support it, want to see it grow, there still is the, you know, the stories of places that I think we all know about, like Peninsula composting in Delaware, that assured everyone they would control odor and could not, in fact, do it and had to be shut down. And, and, and with that is the, um, you know, very important issue and sensitive issue of environmental justice that often these facilities are near communities of color and we, we can't dismiss that. We have to, so I'm just pointing out it's a balancing act with the review and the protections that, that those kinds of things not become a problem and not become a burden uh, to, to nearby communities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Chairman Barve to um, give a final word. And I think that that will, con will then conclude this final work group hearing. Chairman Barve. Uh, yes, first of all, thank you very much to everybody who testified. It was especially the um, uh, composting and organics uh, panel was, I found, very interesting and enlightening. But really, the whole process has been great. I want to thank the members of my committee. I want to thank the members of the work group. I want to especially thank and compliment Delegate Learman for doing such a terrific job uh, organizing this and uh, running these meetings in a timely fashion. And so, and oh, Ben, good to have a Rockville business uh, in the house here. So I represent Rockville. So in any case, um, as I said, this is the beginning of a process. Um, and what we really are aiming to do is build good public policy that takes into account the environmental, social justice, and business reality uh, factors so that at the end of the day, we'll have a public policy solution that is sustainable environmentally and economically as well. And so thank you very much. Thank you, Trish and Kristen, for all the terrific work you've done behind the scenes as well. And let's just all stay in touch. If there's anybody, um, I tell this to everybody, but if there's anyone who wants to meet with me, uh, please avail yourself of that. Please contact Trish, who's my chief of staff, and I'd be happy to talk to anyone offline. So there you go. Uh, Brooke, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for pulling us, uh, for allowing us to pull all together. Thank you so much to all the work group members and everybody who joined us for these hearings. We will continue to meet work group. We'll talk about next steps um, over the fall to determine um, what we think we should be doing and what the state should be looking at in the next legislative session to move forward. Any of you or anybody out there listening, if you have uh, information that you'd like to share with us or a viewpoint that you don't think we covered, we'd be delighted to hear from you in the written word. So feel free to email Trish or email me at brooke.learman at house.state.md.us and we'll make sure that all members of the committee and the work group hear from you um, and have access to your materials. Thank you everybody for uh, in joining us for these three hearings and we look forward to continuing to work with all of you to build a cleaner Maryland and create a more robust recycling infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.